In the early 2010s, Skanders dominated the gaming scene with its new genre that it brought to us. Toys to Life, a genre you probably all know in infamy. It was a perfect marketing strategy, honestly. Kids obviously love toys, so making a game where you can not only have a toy that comes with the game, but you can also use it in the game as a playable character was a stroke of genius, no matter how scummy it may seem. However, I grew up with these games, so I never really saw it like that. And as an avid enjoyer of this series, I have all six games dating from 2011 to 2016. But one of those games has always stuck out to me. Skylanders Superchargers. This was the fifth game in the Skylanders series, and you might be wondering why I think it sticks out. Well, there are many reasons for this. Anyone who knows about Skylanders knows it was famed for having a lot of characters to collect. This is only the second game in the series to have less than 20 characters, and eight of the 18 new characters are just old Skylanders that were brought back with different poses and different figures, so there are really only 10 new characters in this game. But the biggest thing is that Superchargers is often blamed for what you may call the downfall of Skylanders. You see, the game before this trap team in many ways was the peak of Skylanders. Trap team sold a lot of copies and the hype for the Skylanders series was at an all time high. A big reason why these games were loved by so many was because each game thus far had some sort of gimmick. The first game, Sprouts Adventure, the gimmick was Toys to Life itself and making that into a game. The gimmick for Giants was light core characters that lit up in certain parts of your character, and of course the Giants that were bigger characters. Then Swap Forces gimmick was Skylanders that were able to switch tops and bottoms interchangeably, and they would show up in game in those forms that you made. And finally, Trap Team's new gimmick was being able to trap villains and crystals, and you can use those crystals to play as the villains in the game. So as you can see, each Skylanders game up until Superchargers had some new gimmick that I think the majority of people can say was creative and fun. And then comes in Superchargers. I feel like even though there had already been four games, there are still so many new creative ideas that the developers could have used for this new Skylanders game. I mean, the developers behind Superchargers are Vicarious Visions. And in case you don't know who that is, that is the same game studio that made Skylanders Swap Force. The Skylanders game with the most creative gimmick behind it, and quite possibly one of the most creative gimmicks in any game. So what amazing gimmick did they implement in Superchargers? Cars. Yes. Well, not just cars, but vehicles. Specifically, cars, boats, and aircrafts. And this is the first gimmick in the series, and maybe the only gimmick in the series, that just feels out of place and wrong. Just one game ago, we were trapping villains and being able to play as them, and then all of a sudden we're just driving vehicles. And I feel like it's almost not even subjective, but an objective fact that this is a huge step down from the previous games. And that's one of my biggest problems with this game out of the gate. When you build this whole series on the fact that there's this magical world out there full of wonder and adventure with giants, Skylanders that can swap tops and bottoms, and Skylanders that can trap villains, and then you, the Portal Master, can play as villains, and then have, hey, there's also this ragtag group of Skylanders that drive vehicles. It just feels like they're a running thin of ideas, especially when half of the roster in this game are Skylanders that we have already seen. Granted, they do have different abilities and kind of new forms, but we have still seen these dudes before in the past. I don't know if this is a hot take, but I would much rather have seen two new Skylanders in each element than one new Skylander and one old one. And because they went the route of one new Skylander, one old one, once again the light and dark elements were cut short of one character. So already my first impression before I even play Superchargers is that it feels kind of lazy and not quite unique and if you don't know what I'm going to do this video, I'm going back and playing all of Superchargers from beginning to end for this video that I will upload to the internet. And no matter what, even if I end up despising Superchargers more than I already did or end up loving it and it be my favorite game, this video is always going to be called the disappointment of superchargers and real quick i'm also going to set a couple rules for myself before playing the games because i want to make sure i get the full superchargers experience so usually when i'm doing a playthrough of a game i usually just stick to one skander unless they get killed during a level but not this time in every new level i must switch the skander and vehicles i use just to make sure i use the most supercharger skanders as possible and the second rule is that i can not only just do the required land vehicle sections in each level, but I also must do the air and sea 
sections in each level. These aren't required sections, but again, I want to get the full supercharged experience, so I'm going to use the land, sea, and air vehicles. The last rule, which isn't really a rule, but something I thought I'd just mention, is that this playthrough will be in hard mode. The reason why I'm not doing it in nightmare mode is because I don't want to have to like be like fully immersed in the game obviously i just want this to be like a casual playthrough but if i put it on easy mode it's just going to be so mind-numbingly easy that i'll just be zoned out the entire time anyway how this video is going to be set up is that i'll be going through each level giving an analysis of each level and then also talking about the story as well something that i will give superchargers is that i think it has by far the best story in each game the only problem is i don't care about stories and games I can appreciate a good one, but it's not the end-all be-all for me personally. Most of my favorite games ever actually don't have great stories or even a story at all. Black is one of my favorite OG shooters ever and it doesn't even have a story, or at least it tries to have one, but it's barely present. And my favorite Skyrim's game is Imaginators, and yeah, the story is awful in that game. Or maybe another example is Super Mario Bros, where there doesn't really seem to be a story present. Both Spyro and Crash original trilogies, while yes, have story, there isn't too much to them. Anyway, what you might have been able to gather from this little subsection of the intro is that I am not one to care about a good story. I have already fully stated that Superchargers has the best story of any of the Skyrim's games, but that really probably won't affect how I think of the actual game once I replay it. And when I'm recording this section of the video, I haven't actually replayed Superchargers yet. I still have not played the game yet for this video. So maybe the story will have an effect on me, but I feel like most likely it won't. I think this is also a good time to mention that after each level analysis, I will also be scoring the level from a 0 to 100 score. And I feel like a 0 to 100 scoring system is a lot better than a 0 to 10 system. Because I'd much rather give a level a 79 out of 100 than like a 7.9 out of 100. I just think it sounds better honestly, so that's why. Really the scoring system is just here to grade each level so at the end of the game I can give the entire game's levels an average score. No particular reason other than that, I just thought it'd be cool to do that. Also, no, I'm not going over the racing part of Superchargers as it doesn't really play a factor in what I think of the main game. We we're only doing the story mode of Superchargers, and by the end of the game, I will probably have done enough racing for a while. Or really, if you think about it, the main game isn't actually racing. There really isn't any racing in the main game, actually. It's more like just driving vehicles with obstacles in the way. Whatever, that doesn't matter. Anyway, enough chitter chatter. This is probably the longest intro for a video I've ever made. So you might as well just get into the actual video. So let's hop right into Superchargers Level 1. Okay, Level 1, The Rift to Skylands. So the first bit of knowledge we get when we start the game is that Chaos has taken over Skylands and has captured all of our friends including Eon. And already I am a bit confused. Now I know I said I don't really care about stories all that much, but this one section of the story has always weirded me out a bit. Like how does Chaos actually pull this off? First of all in the game before this he gets turned good, which already out of the gate is a continuity error. But the bigger problem is the fact that Chaos was able to do all of this. There is no way possible that Chaos could have taken over Skylands. I think it's implied that the Skylanders weren't missing. But this is also never explained within the game. And I know someone is probably screaming in the comments that it was explained away in one of the Superchargers comics, but dang it, if it was so important, then it should have been in the game. To me, at least, if I don't see it in the main game, it's not canon because I don't really listen to the comics. Why should an aspect so important to the story be hidden away in a comic? It should be in the main game. Also, Eon just has a body now. That's never explained, but let's just go with that. Again, I know I said the story aspects of games aren't as important to me, but I thought this was worth a mention. But back to the level. We are transported into an interdimensional rift, I guess, with a land vehicle and our Skander, and it's our job to make it back to Skylands. Again, no idea why the Skylanders aren't already in Skylands, but whatever. We make it back to Skylands into one of Chaos's cargo ships that stores our friends, which have been captured. Those friends being Callie, Hugo, and of course, Captain Flynn. Something that has nothing to do with this video, but I thought was interesting, is that when I was looking up Flynn for this video, I searched up Captain Flynn in the search bar, and the first thing that came up was a character that was from a Disney Junior show called Jake and the Neverland Pirates. And the thing that was funny to me was that I watched a good portion of the show when I was a kid. And, you know, I think I stopped watching the show when this character that I searched up 
um, came up in the show. You see, the, the character that I searched up, his name is Captain Flynn, and he is a reoccurring character in Jake and the Neverland Pirates from about season two to season four, episode 15, and then after that episode, he never shows up again for the last five episodes of the series. But interestingly enough, finding this out got me on a real nostalgia high for like no reason, and I watched like five episodes of the show, and... You know, Jake and the Neverland Pirates, it, it's, it's, it's definitely a kid's show. It didn't keep me entertained, obviously. I only watched, like, five episodes of it. But it, it was something kind of nice to go, you know, look at. Um, you know, I, I might watch maybe one or two more episodes of it just to, like, really, you know, you know, see what it was all about. And I might watch that, you know, Captain Flynn episode again. Um, but, yeah, this really has nothing to do with the video. And, uh, yeah, I'm done with this mini tangent. Back to level one. We free our friends with very little hardship and we get out to one of the decks where we see this. It's a giant machine that Chaos has somehow built that can eat Sky. Hugo finds a message in one of his books from Eon where Eon explains that this is the Sky Eater and this is the greatest threat to Skylanders yet. But never fear because Eon has sent a special team of Skylanders called the Superchargers that pilot a fleet of supercharged vehicles which are powered by Rift Engines, which remember the word Rift Engines because they'll be important later in the story. And basically they are here to stop chaos. Something interesting to note about this is that this is the first game to not say that the Skylanders were banished to Earth. In Skylander Spire's Adventure, the Spire Adventure characters, after having a big battle with Chaos, the Skylanders are banished to Earth as small toys. In Giants, after a big battle with the Archeans, the Giants get sucked into a vortex which sends them to Earth as crystallized figures. In Swap Force, after a battle with someone who's implied to be Chaos's mom, the Swap Force gets stuck during an active volcano explosion, and the volcano's magic gives them the power to swap, but it also sends them to Earth as small figures. And finally, in Trap Team, when Chaos destroys Cloudcracker Prison, where all the villains are located, the explosion sends the Trap Team hurling towards Earth, and they are too frozen into small figures. Superchargers? Nope, that's completely thrown out of the window. The Supercharger characters are never stated to have got frozen into Earth and just seem to be here. I'm not saying that this is a good or bad thing, but this is interesting since this is a pretty big plot point for the Skylander series and it's no longer present. Then we get to the first vehicle section of the game. I'm not counting the first part of the level since you can't actually replay that part if you replay Superchargers. And this vehicle section that we have is separated into two parts. First we must save some dudes from getting sucked into the Sky Eater, then we have to travel our land vehicle to the next part of the level. And yes, this land section is super boring. However, I'm willing to let it slide since this level is kind of used as a tutorial level, but after this, no more free passes. The next vehicle section is right after we finish the land section, and it's a sea vehicle section. And before we playing this, I remember that my favorite sections overall in Superchargers were sea vehicle portions. So let's see if that still holds up. So this part is pretty okay. The main reason why I think I liked the water vehicle section so much is because they provided the most obstacles. So I didn't feel like I was just doing this portion just because I needed to 100% the game. But I actually liked the challenge and this first C section does a good job of that. The rest of the level is just fighting off Chaos's goons. Then we get to their first air vehicle section. Kind of like the land section, pretty boring, nothing to it. And it's over and done pretty fast. So there you go. Level 1 of Skylander Superchargers is over and done. Again, I'm letting the vehicle parts of this level off the hook because I think it acts as a tutorial level for them, so we'll see if any of the land, sea, or sky parts get harder or if they improve in quality, or if they're the same quality as the original level. So let's get to scoring this level. So in my opinion, the Rift of Skylands is one of Superchargers weaker levels. Mainly this is because level 1s in games can only do so much, but a good part of this level was actively boring. No part in between the vehicle sections were really that fun and just kind of felt there. For all those reasons, Skylanders Superchargers level 1, the Rift of Skylands scores a 65 out of 100. That extra 5 to the 60 is from the C vehicle section, which is pretty fun. So good job to that. I think this level was trying to be more of, like I already said, a tutorial level for vehicles and anything else, really. And because of that, this level is kind of bad in a sense. You know, everything's a bit slower and they kind of baby you over the things that happen in this level. However, this is normal for most first levels within games. So, like I already said, I'm going to let it slide under the rug for this one time. But after this, I am not letting anything slide. Okay, I'm watching you, Superchargers. Anyway, the cutscene after this level, we see a character that you'd only know if you played the 3DS version of Skylander Swap Force, Count Moneybone, and he gets introduced, and we find out that he is currently holding Eon captive, and Chaos shows Glumshanks how to handle your minions. Now we are officially 
one thirteenth done with Skander Superchargers. Congratulations, everyone. Pass on the back to everyone. But we all know how this world works. Unfortunately, I'm not the only person who gets an opinion, and we all have different opinions. So why don't we take into account an opinion about Superchargers from someone you may know about, Lex from Skanda Boy and Girl. Hi Skylander Gamer TV, it is Lex from FGTV and I'm here to give my opinion on Skylander Superchargers. So it's been a pretty long time I must say since I've played the game, but I remember a couple things. So first things first, I just really loved how it physically came with the cool cars. It really switched up the game um, and didn't just give you a figure, it gave you like these cool little things they ride in and all in different like shapes and sizes so I thought that was really cool and I remember when I was younger I always loved to see the huge packages in the store with like the starter portal and also the portal was like a different type of portal so like the cars or like whatever it was um could go on it and it was like really cool so I really like how they like changed it up for that and yeah I think it was really cool how each character had a different one and all these things they had all different types of powers and things that would be useful in the game so that's really what i can mainly remember but i miss it so much and yeah thanks for having me <laughs> bye all right thank you very much lex for stating your opinion that that joke costed a lot of money way more money than i thought it would so please laugh because that's Probably the most expensive joke I've ever had on the channel. So, I I hope you thought that was funny. On to level 2 of Skander's Superchargers, the Cloud Breather's Crag. So the gang finds out that there is a Cloud Breather dragon that can locate anyone so long as you have a belonging of theirs that it can smell. They are stumped for a bit, then Hugo mentions that he has a sock of Eon. I wonder what he's done with that sock. Anyway, with a personal belonging of Eon, Flynn, Cal, and Hugo, and the Skanders head off to Cloud Breather's Crag to find where Eon might be. So something that I never really noticed is that in the introductory cutscene of this level, Cowley and Hugo talk to us on a tablet device for some reason even though we should be in the same ship as them because we're all heading to the cloud breather so where exactly are we then and the answer is i don't know anyway like i already mentioned this looks like a tablet and functions like one which means canonically ipads exist in skylanders so right when you get into the level you are blown away by how amazing it looks i mean this level might be one of the most visually pleasing levels in all of skylanders it's that good. I mean, just look at this opening shot. Wow, it's amazing. Now let's see if the level holds up. So the level is kind of split into three parts. The first part is the shortest, and it sees us traversing the very bottom of the mountain that hosts a village on it. Not too interesting, and then here we go to a land vehicle section. Honestly, I didn't mind this land vehicle section at first, but then we get to this part. I really don't get why they thought attacking enemies was going to be any fun in vehicles, as it really isn't, and you get stuck at this enemy gate for a little while. However, once we get past this, we can get to the second part of the level. This is the sea area part. One of the first things you do actually in this area is go to the sea section now i've already stated that i like the sea areas before but this is probably one of the weaker ones in the game doing everything from a 2d view is kind of just disorienting not to mention that there isn't a lot to do in this area the only other thing to note on this portion of the level is that you ride a ship that promptly gets crashed into another ship which is kind of fun and just like that we are once again in another land vehicle section and right away you get into a gauntlet of enemies. How fun. The only reason why I got through these parts fast was because I was using Hot Streak, which is probably the most broken vehicle in the game. Alright, now here is a vehicle section I actually like. Riding with your vehicle on the back of a flying dragon is pretty awesome. The only problem was I kept getting stuck on this weird part, but I eventually got out of it, and it leads you to the final part of this level. A village on a dragon. Sweet. We get our fine section here as well, and it's nothing to write home about. One of the most nothing vehicle sections in the entire game. At least it wasn't actively bad though. And the rest of the level is just finding enemies until we get to this section right here where we have to fight some more enemies. Once the level's finished, Hugo gives the Cloud Breather Eon sock, and he informs us that Eon was taken to the land of the undead for his imprisonment. And that is where we must go to find him. And then, Flynn farts. I wish I was joking when I said this, but no, Flynn farts. <laughs> okay, that was me. 
This is one of the worst flim moments in the entire series. All right, now it comes to scoring this level. I do think that this is one of the stronger showings in superchargers that it has to offer us. Level design is amazing here. And it's like I already said, one of the most beautiful levels in the entire series. However, there are a lot of boring parts, mainly both sea and air sections. And both land vehicle sections we got here were pretty bland. Besides that one section that we got on the cloud breathers back, that part was really cool. However, I do think that this level, the good does outweigh the bad. We get amazing set pieces and an overall good level in the Skander series. Skander Superchargers level 2, the Cloud Breathers Crag, scores an 80 out of 100. I think this is a good indicator on how Superchargers levels will score. Like, I think only a handful of levels will score higher than this. So, for the most part, we have reached, you know, the peak of Superchargers. You know, for the, for the most, there is a, there are some levels better than this, but this is definitely like top four we're talking about right here. But right up there saying that the Cloud Kingdom is going to score higher than the Cloud Breathers Crag, but we'll get back to that in a sec. So basically, our vehicles don't have enough power to zoom into the land of the undead. Our vehicles only have an output of 3.2 jillion thunderbolts, which is some sort of electricity scale that the game made up. But apparently 3.2 jillion thunderbolts isn't enough to break through the barriers to the land of the undead. We need to be powered with 10 jillion thunderbolts. And to achieve this feat, we need the Thunderous Bolt, and Queen Cumulus, the Queen of the Cloud Kingdom, is very happy to give it to us. But when we get to the level, Lord Stratosphere, who I can only assume to be her abusive husband, doesn't want to give it to us because Chaos told him to keep it away from the Skylanders, and if he does, he will give him a villa overlooking the valley. What a great reason. So now we must go through the Cloud Kingdom that is covered in fog thanks to Chaos's forces that raided the place. The cool thing about this level is that it was actually mentioned way before... Uh, this game and lightning rod's backstory because if it wasn't obvious enough lightning rod hails from this place the cloud kingdom i just think that it's really neat that they would make a whole level about a character's home mentioned in a backstory very nice attention to detail i guess i forgot to mention this but almost each level in superchargers has some sort of gimmick to it and some varying quality we'll get to that in a second but this level's gimmick is the entire level is filled with fog and you can't really see through it and i guess that's because of reasons and this is very apparent when you enter the level this gimmick i'm fine with honestly i don't think it really takes away from the level but it doesn't really add much to it either although enemies kind of use the gimmick like some of the enemies will suck up the clouds to become bigger that's all though Kinda cool. Other than that though, this is one of the best levels within the game. Level design once again is beautiful within the Cloud City. Then we get to the sky section of this level. Most sky areas in my opinion are pretty underwhelming, but this one was a nice break. We get some more awesome views of the city, so I'm not complaining. And the challenge that you must complete during said area is pretty entertaining. After that, you must do a laser puzzle, and then we get to our first land section. I mean, vehicle sections, like I've already mentioned, have never been my thing, but I'd much rather go down a road than have to be in a giant circle with enemies having to fight them and here we are again this part of level i am not too big of a fan of but it is over quickly and basically right after that land section you get put into the sea area i should probably add that in my opinion this is one of the best if not the best sea area in the entire game which means it's all downhill from here great it's a storm sequencer sea area and we must defeat it we first get an awesome sea track race before getting to the sequencer. The thing that I think has always made the sea areas the best is that you get so much variety within them inside of the game. Being able to go underwater with the ships really helps us out. Then after all of that we get to the storm sequencer boss battle and it's fine I guess. Vehicle boss battles can just never really live up to regular boss battles in my mind but for what it's worth this is pretty good. Now that the sequencer is gone though we can get through the rest of the level without some zap blast that were going through the level. You had to dodge them. It wasn't that hard, but yeah, at least they tried. They're not here anymore though. I don't know if it's like some big Skander's Mandela effect or it's just me, but I could have sworn that destroying the storm sequencer got rid of the fog in this level. Like I, I vividly remember that. Like I, I, I Mandela effect, right? So I wanna know if I'm tripping or if this, if you guys thought this too, because I was like really confused. So, so I really want to know if you remember the storm sequence or getting rid of the fog or is it just me? Because, because I am actually, I was actually like really shocked when the fog didn't go away. Then after we finish up with that, we just have to go through one more light beam puzzle and we are off to the boss battle in this land section against Lord Stratosphere. Out of all the vehicle boss battles, he's up there with the best. In fact, he might be the best. 
It just feels more right since we're actually on a racing path instead of a giant circle where we just have to drive around in. Vehicle boss battles are just so much better done this way. Well, actually, they're done better when they're not in vehicles at all. Then after we defeat Lord Stratosphere, we obtain the Thunderous Bolt, and now our vehicles have enough power to get to the land of the undead. Please take the thunderous boat with the eternal gratitude of the Cloud Kingdom. So the Cloud Kingdom is probably my top three superchargers levels. Um, and the Cloud Breather Crag was also around in the top three levels for this game. And there are 13 levels in superchargers. And, and I would say around uh, my top four or five, there's a very wide gap between like the top five and then the rest of the levels. So, like I'm saying, there's a, there's a big dip in quality. So, in my opinion, at least, we really only have maybe two or three more great levels in this game to talk about. At least Superchargers gave us two great levels back-to-back. -back. Anyway, when it comes to scoring this level, it's going to score higher than Cloud Breather's Crack. I think that it's an overall better showing for the game, so it gets an 85 out of 100. Just so you guys know, for a level to get in the 90s, it needs to be like a top 20 level. So, we're going to see if any level is a top 20 level. However, the Cloud Kingdom is probably at least in the top 30 of my favorite Skyrim levels ever. It has some great scenery and it's just overall fun to play in. And that is probably the best thing for this level to do. Just to be fun to play in. That's really all I can ask for in a level. So now that our vehicle's been charged with a thunderous bolt, we can now obtain speeds that will reach the land of the undead so we can save Eon once and for all. When we get to the land of the undead, it turns out the Count Moneybone has turned it into some kind of prison for people who are against chaos. And the main prisoner is Eon, who is encased in Traptanium. Although he can move freely inside of it, so why can't he just get out? Whatever, let's just say that the Traptanium squashes your powers. You're welcome, Skyna Superchargers, for fixing your lore. Now, this level's gimmick is a tad bit weird. There are these portals all around the level that can change your point of view. It's from normal to sideways to upside down. Why the Land of the Undead is a place with this very specific gimmick, I don't know. Let's just roll with it. I think a lot of people think this gimmick is cool, but honestly, I'm pretty neutral about it. I don't think it's good, I don't think it's bad, it's just kind of meh. Also, I just don't think it fits with the Land of the Undead's level theming. Though, when you hop into the level, it looks pretty visually appealing. For a place with a bunch of dead people, at least. And yo, is that Softpaw? So people that have never played Skyrim probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but Softpaw was a character in Swap Force, which at this point in time was two games ago, that made a very brief appearance, but people instantly loved him. He was in the Chaos level and helped you spy around, and now he's back. He talks to us about the mission at hand. Right after the first POV changer, we get to a land vehicle section, and for the most part, it's pretty forgettable and, oh no, an area with enemies. Actually, now it's a part where we enter a POV changer with vehicles and get a TNT to get to the next part of the level. This is pretty fun, believe it or not. I'm actually glad they use this gimmick in the vehicle sections. We get through more of the level, and it becomes very clear that they're trying to make this like the level that Sawpaw is originally from. They're trying to make it like a spy level, which I personally don't think was necessary. Like, it's the land of the undead, and literally every other level we just go into, guns a-blazing. So why is this an exception? But now we also have to dodge spotlights, which, by the way, don't even do anything. I went inside one of them to see what it was like, and what happens is it starts blinking red and making noises. Then if you leave it, it stops. Like, at least teleport us back to somewhere, but it does nothing. Also, something funny I wanted to note was that even though this is a quote-unquote stealth level, there are still multiple instances where we blow up TNT to get through gates. Yeah, real stealthy, guys. But now, I have the dish pleasure of talking about the worst part of this level, the sky section. This might be the worst sky section in the entire game. I mean, my Gilgrun almost died. So for the first part of this sky mission, you have to follow these group of prisoners trying to escape the land of the undead who are in flying ships. They start at one end of the place and you have to get to the other end of the place. Very simple. However, there are enemies that touch the ship and halt them and they can't move whenever they touch them. This seems like a pretty easy task, but oh my god, it was so annoying to finish. Now, if I'm being honest, part of this is probably because I used the Sunrunner. Astro Blast's vehicle is one of the worst in the game, but it's also because this area sucks. Now, the first part of the challenge isn't too hard actually, but it 
it should have ended there. After both ships make it through the end, we have to blow up a statue of Count Moneybone because it's blocking the exit and once we do that, more ships come in. This is where it gets frustrating. For almost no reason at all, the second batch of ships is so much more difficult than the first. It doesn't even last that long, but it felt like forever. None of this helps paired with the fact that this section isn't fun to begin with. But after all of that, you finally make it out. Once you get out, you go through another don't get spotted section, then you get an upside down POV changer, which is kind of cool. And then you're right back in the level with another land vehicle section. This land section, while yes, boring, doesn't do anything super bad to mention. Although there is this one part where you can tell they're trying to be cool, where you go through like a loop, but you can't even control your vehicle when it happens. So what's the point? You just like watch your vehicle go in a circle. And you know what I love more than the vehicle sections? <laughs> well, it's another vehicle section. Right after you get done with this one. Yes. And the worst part is it's a 2D C section, which I've already mentioned are my least favorable C areas. All you gotta do is avoid some mines and you get nothing done here. Nothing notable here. But then the level really delves into its POV changer gimmick. The entire section of this level is a POV changed mode. It's all right though, it never sticks out to me, but I would be lying if I said that some of the shots in this area didn't look pretty neat. But after all that fluff, we finally get to the big battle against Count Moneybone. He is the only one standing in our way to freeing Eon. Yeah, this boss battle sucks. Surprise, another important boss that you can only fight in a vehicle. Any vehicle boss battle is honestly not that fun, but this one especially sucks. With a POV changer in place, you'd think there'd be a lot of area to move around, but no. Each part is a very small circle, and at least for me, it was hard to control the land vehicle while in the POV change modes. Not to mention that the boss battle isn't even that hard. Like, yes, I died, but I was goofing around the entire time trying to make it go by quicker. But once we defeat Count Moneybone, we save Eon. We get a cutscene right after where Chaos yells at Count Moneybone for failing at his one job. Then we see that the darkness can talk. You see at first the darkness was just a vessel helping to power up the Sky Eater, but now you can see the darkness is an actual being. Chaos then uses a voice changer to change its voice. Then we get a really awkward sequence where the darkness ends up choosing his own voice. And when he does this, and there really isn't any other way to explain this, Sexy music plays in the background. J just listen. Oh yeah. That's more like it. Why, that's remarkable, Glumshanks. What did you do? Nothing, sir. It turned itself. The darkness says that they will conquer the whole universe and Chaos should feed him more magic. Then he also implies that he was once in a relationship with Chaos's mother. Okay, so for the most part, the level was actually pretty decent. However, those vehicle sections really weigh it down. All three, you know, all three land, sea, and sky sections were not that strong. The sky sections is one of the worst, and the sea area is super boring. The land sections were a terrible attempt at a boss battle. You see, this is why I don't like superchargers. They have a decent amount of levels ruined by vehicles, and especially in that boss fight. Like, you... Why did Moneybone need to be fought in like in, in a vehicle that could have easily been like a regular boss fight, but they just they force you to be in the vehicle and, and it doesn't even feel natural either. Like it it doesn't feel natural to fight that boss in a vehicle. Like at least with Lord Stratosphere, it, it felt like semi natural that you would fight him in a vehicle, but but for Count Moneybone, it doesn't feel natural at all. But anyway, I digress. I'm giving this level a 70 out of 100. So much potential wasted. So sad. Once we get back to the academy, Eon gets freed from the Traptanium because Mags hit it really hard with her wrench. Now, at this very moment, one of two things just happened. Either Mags' wrench is made out of Traptanium and it's able to destroy the Traptanium Eon was encased in, and nothing is wrong. Or Skylanders broke their own cannon because in the game prior to Superchargers Trap Team, they straight up tell you that Trap Team can only be broken by Traptanium. So thanks for that. But this cutscene also brings up something that I, I really wanted to talk about, and that is that Eon is freed in the fourth level of the game. This is something that, in my opinion, should have happened way later in the game. With Eon being captured, it makes the entire game feel like it has a bit more weight, you know, on it, since Eon is no longer with you. This is the only time in the series where this happens where Eon is not with you. I mean, Eon being captured is like a super game changing thing, right? But when you save Eon so early on, it, it makes it feel like nothing even happened and it, like it wasn't important. This is why, in my opinion, it should have happened around like chapter 11 or even like chapter 12 
you know, the second to last chapter in the game. Eon being the strongest portal master, you know, s still around, you know, we, he have so many, he'd have a lot of secrets, you know, about the darkness that he could have told us to, to beat him. So like he, he should have been saved, you know, w way late in the game so he can tell you those secrets and then you can beat the darkness because of that. But because Eon is brought back so early on, he doesn't actually know what to do. Like legit, all he says is, oh yeah, just, you know, keep the core light running and, and we're good, you know? In fact, the reason why we find out how to find some of the secrets of the darkness isn't because of the NL. It's because of a side character, Sharpfin, who was from Swap Force that was brought back in this game. Eon should have, you know, played a way more important role if they were bringing back, uh, if they were bringing him back this early. And he really doesn't play a big role at all. He kind of just sits to the side and, and does nothing, which personally to me really bugs me. This is why him getting freed should have happened. This should have been late game. You know, him being freed should have been late game. I mean, three out of the first four chapters were actually all levels that were part um, of the free Eon storyline. But instead, almost every level could have been another step to freeing Eon. And then you can sprinkle him some one-off levels. Like, like imagine that. Like, inst instead of, like, the main storyline for Super Charter has been, like, you know, the darkness and this. It could have been, like, trying to free Eon to stop the darkness, you know? Then once you get Eon, he gives you the info on how to stop the darkness. And, you know, you can do that for, like, three chapters. Boom, game over. Eon... Getting out of the hands of chaos so early on just makes the whole situation feel like it didn't even happen. Or at least it wasn't a big problem. And I'm surprised that I haven't heard more people talk about this. But like I already mentioned, Sharpfin tips us off on some information that can help the Skanders find more about the darkness. Basically, Eon knows about a spell punk library that could hold secrets that we are trying to find. But guess what? That old idiot doesn't know where it is. Thanks a lot, oh wise portal master. Thankfully, Sharpfin knows about a big spell punk that will grant you one wish if you beat him in an arena fight. Naturally, since he is a spell punk, the gang think he may know a thing or two about this spell punk library. So we set our courses to Battle Brawl Island. Now, for some unknown reason, instead of flying us on the top so we can just, you know, get in the battle ring to fight the spell punk like we're supposed to, Sharpfin flies us to the bottom. Now, the guy that will let us into the ring is asleep, and instead of slapping him Will Smith style to wake him up, some dude tells us that we need to have a potion to wake him up. Okay, whatever, we smash the potion on him, and he wakes up, and he lifts us into the arena. And guess who's in charge of this ring? It's no other than Baron Von Shellshock. Yet another Swap Force character brought back in Superchargers. He informs us that in order to fight Spellpunk, we need to fight every other competitor in a bracket style competition first. And if you guess that all of these battles we have to fight are super hard and test our strengths, you'd be wrong. These are all jokes. The first jokesters we face are Brimstone and Boulders. These two probably have the best boss fight, or at least it's the most fun. This is because you are fighting two people, so it opens more gameplay options. The only problem is that their attacks are very easy to avoid, and they don't have too much health. Worst thing is that in between each battle, you get a giant amount of food and gold. Just look at this. So as long as you don't eat all the food there, there's almost no way possible you will die. But after Brimstone and Boulders are defeated, we take on Captain Bristlestash. He is a giant pirate dude and his attacks are super slow. Not too hard and he's over and done with real quick. But then we can finally face off against Spell Slams, the guy we came to fight for in the first place. The fight is the best fight in this level. It's probably the most dynamic, I guess you could say, too. The Spell Slammer turns into multiple different Spell Punks that you must all defeat. Then he turns back into his regular form where he shoots an energy beam at you. Then we enter his second stage of the battle where he sends us to another dimension, because if you can't win, cheat. He uses his exact same attacks, but this time we need to cross a bridge of sheep to get to him. Once you defeat his many forms in the different dimension, you go back to Battle Brawl Islands one last time where you can finally defeat him. The spell slams it gives us the info we need and the level is over. So this level is kind of hard to score because this isn't really even a level. It's more like a side mission that counts for as a level. The reason I say this is because there are only five areas you can visit in Battle Brawl Islands. There's the entrance area where you're at the very beginning. There's a room with the potion guy. There's another area where you can play sky stones that I didn't mention. There is the battle ball arena itself. And there's the other dimension that the spell slams are sent you to. You don't even have to go anywhere in between fights. So because of everything I just said, it doesn't achieve a level, I guess. So I have to score lower than any of the other levels we've talked about so far. So battle ball island gets a 60 out of 100. If I'm being honest though, I did have a lot of fun with this level, and that is probably because I didn't have a vehicle to play on. If I'm being for real, 
There are only two levels within superchargers that do not feature any vehicle sections, and this is one of them. And the other level is actually a level very unlike Battle Brawl. But since this so-called level did overstay its welcome, it was actually a fun time. But when I'm scoring these chapters as levels, then it must score low. Sorry Battle Brawl Island, you will be missed. So now that we know the spell libraries in the Hall of the Ancients, thanks to the Spell Slams, we set our courses there. And most of the NPCs and superchargers are on this mission. In fact, I'm pretty sure that only Buzz and Tessa are not in this mission. When we enter the library, Flynn gets sucked into a book. Normal Flynn stuff, and he gets brought out. The book that Flynn gets trapped in also just happens to be the one we're looking for, and then the level starts. So when you enter the level, it doesn't seem that big, and it isn't, because almost all of the level are inside of books. That's the gimmick of this level. Basically, for the majority of this chapter, you'll go into books that suck you into them, much like Flint. When you go inside the book, you get to live through the events of the book in a 2D perspective. And if I'm being honest, I liked this way much less than I remembered. Like, I remember saying that even though I thought Superchargers was the least impressive game, this was still great, but now... I don't know, it just doesn't feel the same and it doesn't feel as great as it once was. Surprisingly, it was unexpectedly annoying at some points. There are just not a lot of movement options available, in fact there's only 4, up, down, left, and right. That's it. It'd be so much better if these book sections were just the same as regular Skyner levels but just with the cool art style. That would be awesome. Like why limit gameplay options just for a gimmick this cool? Sad thing is, this isn't the last book that we'll be seeing in this level. But the first book is about the rift engines and how the rift engines are what made the darkness show up. The book sees us going through some ancient buildings and some obstacles not too much. At the end the darkness shows up claiming that he has returned. Then we leave the first book. And unfortunately all vehicle zones are in books. Which brings us to our first one, the sky section, and yes, it's not only bad, but boring as well. The whole point of sky sections is that they're big and expansive because you know you're flying in the sky, but here you're just confined to a very small box with a couple of waves of enemies. But what the book is about is that once the darkness got control, he also took control of the sky with his minions that flew in sky vehicles, but then some Skanders pilots called the First Light Squadron took on these evil forces. Their armada of darkness eventually fell to the pilots, and their courage inspired others to fight against the darkness. Yeah, this sky section is terrible. I feel like they really wanted to try this theme and thought it'd be cool to put them in vehicle zones as well, but honestly, this 2D view already doesn't work with regular Skander sections, and it so far definitely hasn't worked with vehicles. We travel across the library to examine the next book. This tells a story about the War of the Darkness. The darkness had Skylands in his grip at this point, but thankfully a machine that the ancients built to combat the darkness had been found, the Core of Light. And any Skylander fan knows what the Core of Light is, but for those that don't, it's a machine powered by all the elements in Skylands, and it helps spread light in Skylands and keep the darkness at bay. So when we get into this book, we need to try to find the Core of Light, and we get dropped into a burning forest. Again, this section would be so much awesomer if it was in 3D. And we also get to see the darkness behind you move throughout the entire book part, but it is still boring, and only being able to move in four directions, and really, if you think about it, only two directions, really hurts it. I mean, seriously, look at all the different terrain. Rain. Too bad that it's not in 3D. I mean, I don't hate these sections, they just would have been so much better. And they are a bit boring. Once you get to the end, you find the Lost Citadel of the Portal Master and the Core of Light which had been found, but the darkness still raged on behind them. Then it leaves us on a cliffhanger until we get to the next book. But the next book won't tell us about that story because our next book is a sea vehicle section book. You know, we have already seen a lot of 2D sea areas within the game already, so it isn't actually too bad. In fact, it's, it's kind of cool. But this sea area is about a Hydra, and Dark Portal Masters gave all the food to this Hydra, so people called for the Skanders to retrieve their food. So we need to navigate through the cave while avoiding proximity mines and Hydras poking through the walls. We get to the food and collect it all, but then the Hydra awakes. And fun fact, this is the same Hydra that Chaos used in the first Skanders game to destroy the Core of Light. I like the little callback. After the Hydra gets up, we have an awesome chase section where we eventually get away thanks to a geyser inside of the cave that brings us out to land. Now that we're done with that, we have had one hit vehicle section and one miss vehicle section. Let's see what the last one brings us. We go to Hugo and hop into the final book, which is also a land vehicle section. So inside this book, we find out some bombshell news. The Core of Light was actually never complete. The Skanders needed to power up the Core of Light even though it wasn't complete to try to get rid of the darkness. This actually makes sense even though I doubt they had this idea from the start. It makes sense because 
this is the only reason why the darkness still remains in Skylands, even though the core is powered, because it was never complete. And as of right now, we still don't know what the final piece of it is. Oh, and yeah, the vehicle section's bad. When you go to the land vehicle section, you need to be able to go in all directions, so only being able to go up and down really hurts it. Also, I feel as if this section overstays its welcome. Eventually, the darkness gets to the core of light as the core of light turns on, and it forces the darkness to flee and hide in the deepest and darkest part of Skylands. However, how long will it stay hiding? The book says that one day it will return for its revenge, and in order to destroy the darkness for good, the secret piece of the core of light must be found. Then as the book closes, the author says this is his life's work. The cutscene after shows us that Callie finds out who the author of these books are. It's Pomfrey LaFuzzbottom. Then Eon tells us that we need to find him. Then Tesla comes out of nowhere and joins the gang once again, and the level is over. Also in this cutscene, we get a very good Flynn moment. Um, many ideas? <gasps> LaFuzzbottom! <laughs> What'd you call me? So this level I think I've changed my opinion about the most. I used to love this level and say it had one of the best gimmicks out of any chapter in the game. But now even though I still think the gimmick was great, I do think it was never fully realized and even hindered some of the aspects of this level. Like the vehicle parts. Whether you like it, it's a big part of the level. Also, a lot of the book sections drag on and feel way too long. Honestly, I think exploring the library itself would have been awesome. And I mean, we're in the middle of the sky, so boom, there's a sky section already. And I doubt it would have been hard to add some water for the sea vehicle areas. Or just do what they did and make book parts 3D instead of 2D. But keep the book art theme. I actually really like that theme. So I feel like it could have been amazing if they just used it properly. For all those reasons, the Spellpunk library scores a 75 out of 100. To try to find the missing piece to the core of Lyle, we need to find the author of the books found in the Spellpunk library, Pomfrey LaFuzzbottom. So Hugo eventually finds out that Pomfrey retired and now resides in the Gadfly Glades. But when we get there, something is a bit off. We get there and there's a house and outside of it, there's a bunch of items inside of glass boxes and there is some girl there. It turns out that everything she has is a collector's item. And one of those quote unquote collector's items happens to be Pomfrey LaFuzzbottom. Flint asks if they can borrow him, and of course she says no. He's a super rare mega chase item, the founder of the warrior librarians of the eternal archives, only one in the entirety of the universe and beyond! Yeah, I totally just picked one up, I keep him on display. That's awesome, can we just borrow him? This is also ever one of the first, like, cutscenes that actually has a Skander in it. If you just look behind Flynn and Tessa, your Skander's just kind of chilling back there, which is something that's really cool. Now what happens next is really weird. So the collector girl sees that there is a Skylander and points it out. Then asks us what element we are and if we're a giant swap force or trap human Skylander. Now this part isn't weird, but what is is that she asks us if we're legendary or elites. Now I'm willing to say that legendaries could exist within the Skylander's lore or their universe, but Eon's elite shouldn't be able to exist within the Skylander's universe. If you didn't know, Eon's elites are just better versions of Skylanders that are from SSA that have gold platforms instead of, you know, the regular one. But in the way she says it, she makes it sound like Eon's elites are another team of Skylanders when they're just old Skylanders that Eon thinks are cool. Also, I think it's weird that she knows all this information about Skylanders. This is kind of like a fourth wall break moment in this scene. After she sees that there is a Skander there, she makes us a deal. If a Skander can get to the case that LaFuzz bottom is in and break it before she can stop us, we get palm free. But if we fail, she gets to keep the Skylander. Flynn accepts, but obviously it's not that easy and simple because the collector forgot to mention in the deal that she shrinks us super small and now we're the same size as small insects. Then the small bugs tell us we're the 235th person to make the deal with the collector, and all 234 people do before have failed. All hail, you're all legends. Number 235. Wait, are you saying 234 other heroes have tried this challenge and failed? Oh yes, quite horribly. But now we must try to get back to the case that held Pomfrey while also being extremely small before the collector catches us. Okay, cool premise I guess, and the gimmick for this level is of course being super small. And the cool thing about this level is that you actually feel like you have been shrunken down. I have seen many games fail this seemingly simple technique, but you do actually feel small in this level, so good job Superchargers. Anyway, right away we get a land vehicle section. 
Well, actually, you can choose between doing a land road to get to the next area or a sea vehicle road to get there. I chose a land vehicle one, though, since the sea vehicle section is not the required one to finish the level. And right when you get into the land vehicle section, guess what? It's an enemy gauntlet. And because I'm using the thump truck, aka the worst land vehicle in superchargers, everything just got a lot more fun. And if one of the enemy gauntlets was enough, you get another one right after it. This one is a bit more egregious because the only way you can get past it is you have to lure enemies towards you, then let the collector step on them. It's a very long process and having to use the thump truck is making it not any better. But once we leave the land vehicle section, we get a couple bits of platforming, but we get right into the sea vehicle section. If I'm being honest, I don't think this one is that bad. This is the second best way to do a sea vehicle section. The best, obviously, is a straightforward sea vehicle section, like in the beginning of the storm sequencer section, but at least this one's not a 2D section. Gosh, I've had enough of those ever since Spellpunk Library. Anyway, the challenge isn't that hard. All you gotta do is go around a small lake and save five Twitter pillars. It's over and done pretty quick, but I think it's pretty fun, so there you go. After that, we get some more platform along with fighting enemies. I like these platforms. They're bouncy, like a trampoline, and it's fun. But the fun must come to an end because there is a land vehicle section next. Oh yeah, it's actually just the straightforward drive section. Oh wait, no it's not. Now I will say these enemy gauntlets would have been better if I had used any other vehicle besides the thump truck, but I did, so it sucked really badly. Anyway, once we get done, we are on to the last section of this level. We also get this very nice shot to start us off. We get to go up some broken flower pots along with some bug enemies on our way. When we get about halfway up all the flowers and pots, there's a sky vehicle section. This one is pretty cool. It's not too long, and all you gotta do is shoot down some water faucets, but the area the sky section is in is great. We're in a giant garden with some plants and a fence around it. Like I said, it's short and sweet. In my opinion, that's what all sky sections should be. Once we're done with that, we climb up some more flowers and get to the top of the flower pots and have to fight some more bugs. And I almost died here, and I'm not quite sure how. This is not a hard fight at all. And to end it off, yep, it's a stupid vehicle gauntlet where you have to smash bugs with the collector's feet. That sounded weird, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. I died in this section. Again, it would have been more annoying than hard if I used really any other vehicle, but the thumb truck made it super annoying. It still isn't a good section though. Once we get done, we launch the Pumphrey the Fuzzbottom's cage, winning the game and being able to take Pumphrey back to the academy with us. But before we get back to the academy, something insane happens. We load into a cutscene where Chaos is trying out new outfits when the darkness interrupts him, and he tells Chaos that the Skylanders are turning the core of light into a weapon, and if they use it on him, he won't be able to eat up all the sky. Do you realize that while you're in here playing dress up, the Skylanders are turning the core of light into a weapon? They can't be allowed to use it against me and stop my plan to consume all of the sky in Skylands. Then Glumshanks points out an obvious flaw with the Darkness' plan, saying that if all the sky is eaten, there won't be any left to live or rule over. Chaos asks Darkness if this is true, and the Darkness tells him that he can not only just rule over Skylands, but the entire universe. Um, excuse me, Mr. The Darkness, sir, but if you eat all of the sky, doesn't that mean there won't be any left in Skylands? So, what's your point? Why settle for just Skylands when there are so many other worlds out there waiting to be ruled by you? <gasps> then the darkness does something unthinkable. He tells Chaos that Glumshanks has always stood in his way of greatness. Then Chaos does something even more unthinkable. He fires Glumshanks. Of course you know, there will always be those who'll try to stand in the way of your greatness, Chaos. Ooh, you're right! You have always held me back, Glumshanks! And now I know why! Well, never again! Do you hear me? Glumshanks! You're fired! <laughs> I think the reason why this is so big is because no matter what, Glumshanks and Chaos have always stuck together. They are like this weird couple, you know? No matter how much abuse and horrible things Chaos does to Glumshanks, Glumshanks always sticks with him. And no matter how much Glumshanks makes it apparent that he doesn't really like any of Chaos's plans, Chaos still keeps him around. In a weird way, it's almost like they need each other, kind of like the yin and yang sign. Because up until now, Glumshanks has been like the voice of reason for Chaos. Now, he might have not always listened to Chaos, or Chaos might have not always listened to Glumshanks, but still. However, it seems like as of right now, the darkness has taken full control of Chaos, feeding him with lies about everything. 
Anyway, once we get back to the Academy, Pomfrey says that he discovered that the Core of Light was never complete because its original function was not to be used as a shield, like we use it in all the games, but its original purpose was to be used as a weapon to defeat the darkness once and for all. To complete it, we need to find the missing piece, which is the Eye of the Ancients. Then we can see the Core of Light's true potential. Then right after this dialogue, Glumshanks falls onto the Academy ship and the level is over. Whiskers, what's the problem? What are you carrying? Congratulations, you found a troll. Good bird. Just any troll. It's Glumshanks. Now, one thing I want to do, talk about real quick before the level scoring, is another Mandela Effect moment. If you don't remember, we already had a Mandela Effect moment in the level Cloud Kingdom. Now, this Mandela Effect moment is this. I remember the missing piece to the Core of Light was the Rift Engines for some reason. I personally think that I might be the only one that remembers it this way, though. But the Eye of the Ancients is just such an afterthought in this game, it doesn't feel like it's the big missing piece that has been lost to time. Especially when you get to the level. Now, I think that's the big reason why I remember the missing piece being the Rift Engines, because, like I said, the Eye of the Ancients is just so passable in this game. Now let's get to scoring the level. So something I don't remember about this level is that it's actually really short. It's about 27 minutes, which is actually on the shorter side of levels for superchargers, but this level is just mostly vehicle sections. There isn't that much in between land vehicle sections, sea vehicle sections, and the sky vehicle sections. There isn't that much in between the land vehicle section and the sky vehicle section. Then there's barely anything between the other land vehicle section and the sky vehicle section. This level is mostly vehicles, which isn't good in my opinion. I think this level also showed me that the thumb truck is atrocious and I should never use it again. But this level scores a 75 out of 100. Because, like the last level, it really isn't bad, but there just isn't anything that stands out to me about it. It feels more or less like a buffer level. But now that we're about halfway through the game, I think it's important that we talk about something that we haven't talked about yet in this entire video. So let's take a real quick break or intermission and talk about something that I think is very important to this game. Now that we're halfway through the game, I thought this would be the perfect time to talk about these guys, the roster superchargers. Since we just completed chapter 7 of superchargers, we are now halfway through the game. Well, technically not. Since there are an uneven amount of chapters in this game, since there are 13 chapters in this game, you can't really actually ever get an even a halfway through. Half of 13 is 6.5. So if we really actually wanted to talk about this at the exact halfway mark, it would have been halfway through chapter 7. But obviously I don't want to do that, so we just finished chapter 7. And we're talking about the roster, because I feel like this is the last time we can talk about the roster. Because I forgot to talk about the roster in the very beginning of the video, because I forgot to add that in the script. My bad. Anyway, so, there we go. Now before we get actually started, I do need to have one quick confession. To this day, I am still missing some of these characters. Three. I am missing Bone Bash Roller Wall, Lilance Eruptor, and I am missing Splat. But I'm actually really only missing two. I'm only missing Splat and Lilance Eruptor because I did at one point have Bone Bash Roller Ball, but I sold her. Yeah, that, that's one of the worst mistakes I've ever made. I'm sorry about that. So I do kind of know what Bone Bash Roller is all about. We'll get to it though. But really, I'm just going to try to give a rundown of each character. Say if I like them, say if I'm not. And really, the vehicles don't matter. But if you are miss or if you are wondering who I'm missing, I'm missing the Tomb Buggy. I never actually had that one, but I did have Bone Bash Roller Never had Tomb Buggy. I'm missing the Shield Shredder. And I am missing the Buzzwing. So I'm missing three Skonders and three vehicles. Really? I'm almost done with my Skonders collection. I'm only missing one from Superchargers, the ones I just mentioned from, you know, I'm sorry. I, the ones I just mentioned from Superchargers, I'm missing one from Swap Force, and I'm missing like I'm probably six or seven from you know, Trap Team. I'm missing a lot from that game. Anyway, let's get into it. Astro Blast. Astro Blast is kind of cool because he's one of the first ever Skonders that actually wields a gun. What I mean by that is you'll have a lot of Skonders with projectiles like Gilbrand. It's not really a gun though, but Astro Blast kind of works as a gun. So, I don't know if it's like this when you first have him. I honestly totally forgot. I'm only talking about these in their fully upgraded forms. But Astro Blast, what he does is has a laser gun that shoots lasers, which already by itself is pretty neat. But those laser beams also ricochet. If you saw the Battle Royale Island gameplay in the background of that level, you saw those ricochets do a lot of damage when they're added up together. Pretty cool. Astro Blast can also like throw a rock in the air, and if you shoot it, it's kind of like a disco show. It's pretty cool. And his soldier is really odd. So basically, there'll be like a green sheep that he spawns, and a UFO will come to get it. 
it's not that good. But overall, I, I think Astro Blast is a, a good character. Can't say the same for his vehicle. His vehicle sucks. It is not good. The, the Sunrunner is garbage. It's it's not good. Anyway, Fiesta. Fiesta might be my least favorite character in the entire Sky in the series. I'm not even joking when I say that. He's, he's definitely in the top three. It's between Head Rush and him. But he is not the bottom two for me. He sucks. He's terrible. And, and the worst part is that at least Head Rush, like, her design looks bad. So you kind of already expected it. But Fiesta looks pretty cool. Like, he, look, he looks cool, right? But when you use him, it's a total letdown because he's just not good. His attacks don't do anything. So his first attack, basically, he has... I forgot what that's called, but he has that. And he shoots music out of it. But it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do any damage. And if you hold it down longer and longer, more notes of music will come out and they'll do extra damage. They're like harpoons, kind of. But they don't do anything at all. And then in, his, in this game, he has this thing called Amigos, which he can spawn, which don't do anything as well. They basically just spawn. They do a little bit of damage. But they don't do that much. He, he sucks. He's not good. And then you can do a thing. The one good thing, kind of good about him, is he can turn into a hat. Like, we'll, we'll just, like, turn into a head in a hat and just drop on the floor. And enemies can't see you. But it, it's just really not that useful, honestly. Even though, like, it's his, probably his best ability. It's not that good. He's one of the worst scoundrels ever. Definitely. Uh, his vehicle, the Crypt Crusher, is okay. It's just... It's mid. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, like, bad, but it's not good either. So, at least with that about him. Bone Bash Rumble. Like I said, I already had her. I don't remember too much about her. But what I do remember is that, like, even though they try to make all the Skonders new versions, the one that, you know, all the old ones that got brought back, like Terrafin, Lava Lance Raptor, they're trying to make them new. Rollerball feels the less like this. Like, she feels, like, very much like her original character. But that's all I remember about her. I do remember that, I guess, the reason why I sold her was because I didn't like her that much. So, there's that. Smash it. Now, I know a lot of people don't like Smash it, but I personally think he's okay. I don't think he's that bad, honestly. I, I, I think you have to kind of, like, use him for a while to kind of understand, like, how good he is. So, basically, uh, his regular attack is you swing this thing around, which by itself isn't that good, honestly. If you just had that, that isn't that good. But what you can do is when you get, you know, better attacks, that you can actually take this part off and just swing the chain around and hit you with the chain. And that's honestly pretty good. And something else cool is when you put that giant rock down, it spins and it does damage to people as well. And if you bring it back, you can do a giant slam on the ground attack, which does a lot of damage. That That's honestly pretty good. And you know, honestly, I, I I feel like he's a bit underrated. I think he's I think he's pretty good, honestly. You just kind of, you know, got, got to get to used to, you know, use him and stuff like that. Although the thumb truck, good for health, really good for health. But what I learned really fast is that for attacking, it's terrible. It's not good. Maybe for racing in superchargers, it's okay. But for attacking, it is absolutely terrible. You can't do any damage to that. And we'll get actually very soon to a level where I did, or, or maybe it already happened, I totally forgot, where I did use him and his vehicle, and it was terrible. It was actually, I think I already played it. Yeah, I did. You, well, you've already seen that level. And that, that that vehicle is terrible when it comes to attacking enemies. Um, you know, it's just terrible. And that's because it doesn't actually have any attacks on the thumb truck. The first attack is where a bunch of rocks like form around him and stuff like that. And honestly, I forgot what the second attack is, but I know it doesn't do damage. She doesn't really have any damage attacks, which is like terrible for a vehicle. I've talked more about his vehicle than the actual character, I think. My bad. Anyway. Structured Terrafin. This time, normally Terrafin punches and stuff like that. He was a brawler. This time they gave him a giant gun. And he can still go underground. Now, what I think about this, I think he... This is a slightly improved version. Honestly, I never really liked Terrafin that much. I thought Terrafin was always a tad overrated because he was in the original 32. I, I, I think Sharpshooter Terrafin is honestly pretty good. I, I I like it. You know, his his missiles do good damage. And you can still go under the ground and do that stuff. And when you go under the ground, he can come up and just shoot missiles, which is honestly really cool. I, I, I like it. I like it. I, I, don't, I think this is a better version overall than his last version so yeah now a lot of lance eruptor this is the one that I, I this is one of the two that i've never had ever although i from the gameplay he does look good like I, he probably is worse than the original eruptor it's gonna feel like eruptor is more of like a lobby it's kind of the sword skylander that's just my opinion though anyway and his vehicle's okay too his vehicle's 
probably the second best vehicle, but vehicles aren't really that good, actually. We're about to get the best vehicle, which is Spitfire, and its driver, I mean, sorry, it's Hot Streak, and its driver is, is Spitfire. Spitfire is probably the best gun, is the best gun here. Let me see. Actually, you know, Spitfire is probably the second best Condor here. Um, you give them the starter pack, which is very typical of this gun, best kind of being the starter pack. Spitfire is just probably your best overall, like, well-rounded Condor. You know, he's kind of like the Crash Bandicoot and Nitro Kart, whatever you want to say. He's like the Mario. You know, he's, a, I think he's the overall well-rounder. His, you know, regular attack rate to slash people, that's pretty good. He can make fire tornadoes, which is also really good. Something really cool is that... When you fully upgrade him, his fire turns red. Even though they said the blue fire is always hotter, so really, like, lore-wise, they're nerfing him. It still looks really cool, though. And he gets his eye, his pupils go away, and it's just, like, fire. That's really cool. The tornado move really good. And he also has a dash ability, which is also really nice. Overall, I think he's the second best counter. We'll get to the first best, though. Now, High Volt. He's probably the third best counter. Like I said, Hashik's the second best. Hyvolt's the third best. He can heal enemy. Uh, he can heal himself, not enemies. I'm sorry. He can heal himself when he's like... The, the thing is, he can heal himself, right? Which is really cool. But he can only do it when he has low health and enemies are attacking him. So it's kind of like... Eh? Like, is that really good? I don't know. Anyway, he can swing this giant staff that he has, which is a really good ability. And he can also just throw it out and it sticks on the ground. And then, like, electromagnetic waves will stuff will attach his hand... In his, in his staff, and he can just swing around, like, just woo, woo, woo. Not, like, swing up, like, around, like, the thing. Like, he's not holding the pole. He's, like, floating. And it's honestly really nice. He's, again, really versatile. Third best kind of. A double trick rapid. I, I, I think he's a... I think he's actually worse than 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 the original trick rapid. I think double trick rapid... Double dare trick rapid. That's a mouthful. It, it, it's slightly worse than regular Trigger Happy. So basically, I think the thing that puts regular Trigger Happy over the edge is that tr regular Trigger Happy can make a machine gun. So basically, he puts his two guns together, boom, and starts shooting his machine gun. Double Dare Trigger Happy does not have this attack. Double Dare Trigger Happy's attacks are obviously his guns, which is pretty cool. But instead of the machine gun, they gave him a cannon. Like, he doesn't shoot stuff out of the cannon. He goes inside the cannon himself and gets shot out of it, which is not as good as the machine gun attack from his original character. So, overall, I do think he's worse. However, he is the only Skander from any other element besides Life and Undead, I'm pretty sure, that has a ability where he can come back from the dead. Basically, he has two lives, or three lives, if you count the original one, and once he originally dies, he will go inside of a gold box and pop out with a little bit less health. So I will give him that, but overall, I do think he is slightly worse. And his um vehicle, which I forgot the name of, Gold Rusher, is is probably the second best land vehicle. I mean, let me see, hold up. Yeah, probably. It, it it's one where it's kind of like it's kind of like Hot Streaks. The reason why Hot Streak is so good is because Hot Streak all has a dash ability where it makes him go faster, which makes all the gear bits in the game, which you see in the tracks, gold, which get more more value and also his his weapon the hot shirt's weapon is like fire and a lock on enemies i think he's the only one that does that besides the shark tank but it's really slow and i think the gold rusher just really even though his attacks don't lock on it just goes everywhere so it's kind of it's kind of good you know all right nightfall a lot of people hate on nightfall personally i think she's all right i i, I think she's pretty good I think her design is awesome. I mean, look at that. That that's crazy looking. Although, like, she, she's just she's okay. Like, she, yeah, you know, she's like, um, her. I think the thing is weird is that her tacks are like hooks, so like they, they kind of go like this. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like it's getting a lot of damage in there, but it's pretty cool. I think it's like weird though. Is like she kind of has the ability where she goes on the ground. She basically like, go on the ground and like, you know, like dark stuff will fall her and boom, come out stuff like that. That's kind of cool. But overall, I, I think a lot of people put her in, like, last place for superchargers. I think she's yeah, she's probably, like, if we're ranking, like, the eight superchargers, she's, like, five or four. Like, she's she's not, she's not that bad. All right. Stormblade. Uh, you know, the air is kind of stacked. I think both these ones are pretty good. Probably, unless I get Lala and Serup and I really like them, I think air is probably the... Actually, no, air is not. It's the second best. We'll get to the first best in a minute. Stormblade is... She's good. 
No, she has like these abilities. The first one's where she like throws knives or whatever. Not knives, but like it's not shuriken, so I don't really know what to call it. That's pretty good. She also has a dash ability, kind of like um Spitfire. Sorry, like that. Well, she go like super fast and it'll damage enemies too, so that's pretty cool. And then she can go up into the sky and rain blades down, which is really cool, but it's not effective. If it did more damage, it'd be way more effective, but it doesn't. I think it only does like 12 damage per like you know, little knife that hits an enemy, so it's really not that good. It's still awesome though. But in her her original primary attack, Old Faithful, it, it's that it's it's good enough to carry through the game. She's probably ranked fourth. Fourth. Yeah, yeah. Nightfall's fifth. She's, she's probably fourth. All right. Now we get to Jetpack. I think that Hurricane Jetpack is the most improved supercharger from the original form. OG Vet. <coughs> I'm sorry. OG Jetpack, while a lot of people hate him, I don't think. A lot of people hate on OG Jetpack. But I think he's all right. But I do think Hurricane Jetpack is the most improved version. Well, let me tell you why. So, a regular Jetpack, he's all right. His gun that shoots clouds, it's always been good. But this one, it's just so much better. They shoot like little mini hurricanes, which is awesome. He can also kind of fly, which is really cool. It, I, I just think overall that he's the most improved. I think his web, his weapon's just really good. He can also suck enemies in, like closer to him, which is awesome. I, I think he's the most improved, hands down. And both of these vehicles are pretty good. I, I think I think the Sky Slicer is a tad better, just because I think it's it feels more fast, like more smooth. But uh, the jet stream is still an amazing pick as well. So there you go. All right, super shot stealth elf. I really don't know anything about super shot stealth elf. Stealth elf is pretty good as she already is. I, I think super shot stealth stealth elf is worse though. I, I think slightly because they just took her core values away. You know, they took what was good about super shot stealth elf, and although it isn't bad, it just doesn't feel the same. It, it's just probably the most changed from all of these characters. Instead of you know wielding melee weapons she wields this giant like machine gun which i mean like yeah shark your teraphin is like like that but i think it's even worse with uh stealth elf but um so if not stealth elf her uh her, her, her cannon's pretty good it, it shoots pretty nice and you even get lasers her her ability where she um becomes invisible is also there still what i think is a really nice touch they kept that in the game so I think really the only thing that really changes her, because I think she keeps most of her moves. The only moves that don't they they get rid of are they both the ones that have to do with her blade. So really she's like the same, just with one extra tag, and she got rid of some of her other attacks. So she's like the super shot stealth elf is a right first stealth effect character, she's pretty good. And uh her vehicle, the stealth sneaker, is it heals itself, so it's probably one of the better air vehicles. Alright. Thrillipede, let's see. So if I bring Spitfire second best. I don't know. Philippi might be third best, actually. And Highbolt might be fourth best. Which means Swordblade is fifth best. And Nightfall is sixth best. Even though I still think Nightfall is a good thing. Anyway, Philippi is awesome. Melee attacks. He punches people. He can like throw grenades. He can turn into a cocoon and pop out of it. It's just a really gimmicky Skander, which I really like. They really, you know, used his um his species, I guess, which is a bug to their ability, and he throws grenades, he punches people, he can pop out of cocoons, it's really awesome, he's really good. I don't have an opinion about the buzzwing though, because I don't have it. Now, we're about to get to the best Skander in this game. Is it Deep Dive Gilgrunt or is it Diclops? If you guess Diclops, you're wrong, it's Deep Dive Gilgrunt. Deep Dive Gilgrunt is hands down the best Skander from this game. It's not even close. The gap between Spitfire and Deep Dive Gilgrunt is huge. It is huge. That is how much better he is than him. So basically, they just made Gilbert and made him better. This trident does so much damage. He can, you know, you know, stab people with it, but he can also like boom, boom, boom. Like it's, <coughs> I'm coughing just how good it is. Um, basically, he can like you can kind of like turbocharge it, and you just like hit a bunch of enemies at the same time, like boom, boom, boom. Awesome. He can like use his uh, jetpack, water jetpack to fly up, and you can and there's all new abilities. When you use a jetpack, you can go forward and water, you know, goes in front of you. You can also, like, make lightning fall everywhere. It, it's so good. It's so good. He's the best counter from Superchargers. And in the gap between, like I said, the first best and the second best, it's like a, the, the Grand Canyon. That's how much better that he is. 
And I think Spitfire is really good. He's probably a top 10 Skander. All right. Dive Clubs isn't bad, though. <laughs> it's actually really hard to rank the Superchargers, not like the new ones. I mean, not the old ones that got brought back, the new ones. Because I feel like they all fall in the same, like, mediocre category. So, if I had to rank all of them, not ranking Splat, because I don't have her. Last, definitely Fiesta. Um, I guess, I, I guess set six is Smash Hit, even though I don't think he's bad. He's just mediocre. So, fifth would probably be Nightfall. Fourth would probably be Dive Clops. Third would be Stormblade. Second would be High Volt. And first would be Spitfire. But that's just ranking the, 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 the old one, the, the new ones. If we're ranking the ones that came back, I think they're probably rank higher than the Superchargers. Anyway, what's this? Um, Dive Clops is a really weird Skander. His second attack doesn't do that much like you'll never use his second attack his first attack's good where he shoots his you know dive bombs out of his gun and his second attack he'll like hit his helmet and this green beam will come out and it'll blow all the mines that his that his you know bombs make and it'll blow them all up but you just never use his attack at least i don't i never use his attack i only started using his attack just because i felt like i needed to and then like his other attack is where he'll point a finger and hit the green solar thing will come out to blow up the mines. But you just, like, never use that attack because, like, there really isn't a reason to. Because usually his, his die bombs aren't good enough to get the job done. And then his third attack is where basically he'll, um, this you know, this helmet around him, he'll open it up and water will come out. But it's just not effective because it doesn't do enough damage. If it, if it did more damage, it would be really good. But it's just not effective. All right. And on to the last counter that I actually have, which would be big... Big Bubble Pop is. Big Bubble Pop is, man. Um, sorry if you just saw a cut in the video because I think my camera ran out of space, so I had to redo it a bit. We were at Big Bubble Pop this so I think, and people are going to hit me for this, I think he is slightly better than Rainbow Pop is. And that is because his beast mode has multiple types. So you can have a green beast mode, a blue beast mode, and a red beast mode, which is awesome, and it's really cool. They all have different attacks. And his bubble attack isn't that good, but I think his beast mode makes up for it because there's so many different options, and it's honestly really cool. And I'm, I hate my camera died because I was basically over at the section. Overall, the Superchargers roster, it's all right. You know, I, I just think other rosters are better than that. So if I had to rank the rosters, imagine his roster is first. It's not even close. All the scouts are overpowered. Second best is probably Trap Team. Third best is Swap Force. Fourth best is Giants. Fifth best is Superchargers. Oh, wait. No. First best is Imaginators, like I said. Second best is Trap Team. Third best is SSA. Fourth best is Swap Force. Fifth best is Giants, which means sixth best is Superchargers. Honestly, I can't really rank all the rosters right now. All I know is that Imagine is, is first because they're su super overpowered. I just feel like this roster could have been so much better if they just didn't have these vehicles, man. They, it would have been so, it would have been so much better if they just didn't have the vehicles. Like, 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 imagine that. Like, imagine like in, we'd have like what? That's one, two, so that's four, eight, sixteen, twenty-four, thirty-two, forty, forty-eight. Um, I I messed up. I messed up. I'm sorry. We would have had a lot more scoundrels. <laughs> we would have at least had uh, 32. We, yeah, we would have, yeah, this is 32. We would have had 32, 36 new scoundrels instead of 16 new scoundrels. Wait. Yeah, yeah, that, that works out. That works out. And if it doesn't work out, you're wrong. So, yeah, anyway. Um... I just really wanted this section to talk about the roster. And since I forgot to put it in the very beginning of the video, because I'm kind of editing this video as I make it, I couldn't really just fit it in there because I already wrote the script and, you know, said all this stuff in the script. But yeah, this was kind of like an intermission, I guess. Not really. I just wanted to talk about the roster because it's obviously very important to the Superchargers because it's part of the game. But let's get to the second half of the game, which means we're only halfway through this video. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but I assume it's going to be long. But let's get to the rest of Superchargers. Yay! I think. 
All right, after that quick intermission, I think we are ready to get right back into superchargers. And in case you forgot where we left off in the game, we just finished the seventh chapter, Gadfly Glades, which leaves us six chapters left. Like I said, the halfway point. Now, we do need to discuss some things that happened in between levels that we really couldn't discuss before. So once Glimshank lands on the ship, Buzz instantly questions him, but after giving us a chaos punching bag, everyone just decides that Glimshanks is no longer a threat. After that, we walk over to Eon, and he informs us that he has located the Eye of the Ancients, and the missing piece to the Core of Light. But, it is in the possession of the Titans, who are basically what the Giants should be. And obviously, the Skylanders, in their forms right now, cannot defeat the Titans, because they are so big. So that means that we need to become the size of a Titan. And the only way possible, apparently, is with the Colossal Colonel. And guess who has it? None other than Captain Cluck. So if you don't know who Captain Cluck is, he is a character that was brought back from Swap Force to this game, like a lot of other characters in Superchargers. He was the main villain in an expansion pack level called Tower of Time, where Cluck had taken over a village and holds the Tower of Time, and he can control all time in that level. You beat him, whatever, he's back. And also he owns a fast food business. So apparently in the two year span of Skylanders defeating Cluck and Swap Force, and now, he's opened an entire fast food industry, and no one is suspicious about this. Anyway, Eon somehow knows that the Colossal Colonel is located within his fast food headquarters. Also, his restaurants are called Captain Cluck's King Size Chicken. And the developers even made a little jingle for his restaurant. Take a listen. Who's got the grub when the grub needs getting? Faster feast when time is ticking. Same old scheme, but it's still sticking. Captain Clucks, king size chicken. Captain Clucks, king size chicken. I don't know why that's so funny to me, but honestly, it's awesome. So thanks, Vicarious Visions, for making that. Just letting you know before the level starts, it's probably a top 4 superchargers level. When we enter the level, you can see that Captain Cluck is using his fast food restaurants as a cover up for his chicken army. You see, the reason why Cluck has a colossal colonel is to grow a chicken army, because the colonel supersizes the chicken in his army. To try to cover up this, he uses the colonel also to supersize the food in his restaurants. When we enter the level, a Captain Cluck king size chicken employee shows us the gimmick. So whatever has a purple glow on it, we can supersize or make smaller. This actually opens up way more gameplay options than you may think. The first thing we can do with this power is to move platforms to get around the level. Then you also get puzzles that use a supersize mechanic that you have to use to get through them. We get a couple of these throughout the level. Then we get to see another way you can use the supersize powers for, to defeat enemies. There are some hammerhead, sack, and giant acorn enemies that are affected by the supersize in some sort of way. If you shrink the hammerhead instead of using his head to hit, he starts kicking you. If you supersize the sack enemies, their sack becomes too heavy and you can just defeat them easily. If you supersize the acorn enemies, the acorn will grow and squash them. I just like seeing enemies attacking styles change, so I like this gimmick so far. We get dropped down to shoot and into the next part of the level and also right into the sea vehicle section. Now this is one of the best sea vehicle sections, not because of the first part. This first part is fine, not a 2D section, but it's the second part. Now, this is how every vehicle section should be handled. Sea vehicle sections in particular. First of all, the water is purple and that's awesome. It also utilizes the ability for sea vehicles to go underwater to the fullest. There are obstacles and the scenery is great. It just has everything. Great section. Once that is finished, we get to a weird part where you have to dodge flying chickens that shoot at you. Then we get another enemy that can be affected by the supersizing mechanism. There are wooden dudes that have spinning blades on them. If you supersize them, their blade gets broken and they just punch you instead. We get a second supersizing puzzle and after dodging some more chickens, we get off to our first land vehicle section. And they are some of the worst within the game. Not the parts where you're driving, those are fine, they're actually good. But they get ruined by what comes next. You get launched into these sections where you have to move chickens into some vacuums, but oh my gosh, these things are hard to control. They're also really light, so you can easily lose them, and it doesn't help that there are poles all around that bounce you and your chicken around. Getting one of those chickens in the vacuum was hard enough, but right after that, you get launched into another one of these sections, but this time you have to do it three times. Great! But after that, we're finally done with that wretched vehicle section. Glad we don't have to do that again. That's foreshadowing. Literally right after this, we get right into the sky vehicle section. The first part of the air section is actually really unique, and something to my knowledge is the only time you see it. You fly your vehicle from a front view point of view, because we're getting chased by a giant rooster that's barfing eggs at us. How pleasant. And this part is pretty entertaining. Then we get put into a giant chicken coop, I guess, and the rooster, who's apparently named Cockadoodle Doom, hops on a giant silo and starts shooting at us 
with that egg gun. Kind of a goofy part, but whatever. Like the C section, it's a great other vehicle section. One of the better ones in the game because you're entertained the entire time. We get another supersized puzzle, then platforming, and then fighting. And then we get our last supersized puzzle, which took me a long time for some reason. Then we get to Captain Cluck's boss fight and it's in a vehicle. Awesome. I can't count how many cool bosses in this game were in vehicle sections. And the most heartbreaking part, the way you defeat Captain Cluck is by shooting chickens at him, but putting them into vacuums. You have to do this four times and it's as horrible as it sounds. I said this ranked in my top four supercharger levels because one, a lot of other supercharger levels are worse, but mainly because the rest of the level carries those two horrendous land vehicle sections. This is probably a rare case where the land vehicle sections make a level worse, and we actually just saw that happen in the level previous to this, Gadfly Glades. I feel like it's hard for a land vehicle section to ruin a level simply because land vehicle parts are meant to be pretty linear, which makes it hard to be bad. But when they add things like these to the areas, it's bad. And I think that this level, while yes, is good, actually points out a huge flaw with superchargers that I do think I have talked about, but I'm going to talk about it again. Almost every single important boss battle in this game is in a vehicle. And this just detracts from the experience because I want to actually fight these really cool bosses. But instead, I'm just stuck in this vehicle doing loop-de-loops and, you know, it's just not that fun. But with that being said, this is hands down the worst vehicle boss fight, so at least we got that filth out of the way. Captain Cluck's king size chicken scores an 80 out of 100, you're lucky, cause I'm feeling generous. Thank goodness the rest of the level was good besides those two land vehicle sections, they were just really terrible. Once we defeat Cluck, we obtain the Colossal Colonel, and now we can head over to where the Titans live and use it to grow to their size. However, we first must pop the Colonel and turn it into a popcorn so we can eat it. Yep, that is in the Skylanders lore, a giant popcorn. But Max helps us with that, and now we can go to the Titans with our oversized popcorn. So for the entirety of the last two levels, the characters have been hyping up these titans as big monsters that are going to be really hard to defeat. But when we get there, we see that the titans are basically just teenagers from Teen Beach Movie. They live on a beach and just chill out. I'm not even sure if they ever say that the Thunder Toad, the titan has the eye of the ancients, even knows what it really actually is. Now I know it's obviously supposed to be a joke that these big villains are actually just stupid, but it makes the whole eye of the ancients thing seem so passable. Like the level doesn't feel like we're trying to find the lost part to the core of light and finally restore it to its full power. It just feels like we're going to get something that isn't even that important. It just ruins the whole vibe. Anyway, more about the level. So when we first arrive at Monstrous Isles, we are still normal size. But Feathers, Tessa's pet, drops down the popcorn and we eat it and it turns us into a giant. You see, this is what Skylanders Giant should have been. And it's actually pretty awesome too. However, something very weird about this level is that for some reason the Skylanders walk incredibly slow in their giant forms, so the only way you can move around in a reasonable amount of time is just jumping. And this is another case like in Gadfly Glades where I realized that this level isn't really that long. The majority of this chapter is in vehicles. Almost no part of this level is actually outside of the vehicle. And when you're outside of the vehicle, you're probably just fighting the boss because the three bosses in this game are all fought outside of vehicles. And I think this is because of how the Skylanders movement works in this level. When you're in a giant form, it is really annoying to move because all you can do is jump to move fast. I guess the devs couldn't work around that, so they just thought making the level full of bosses and vehicle sections. But let's see how this vehicle section and bosses hold up. Now right after we turn giant, we get to stomp around a bit, then get launched into our first land section of the level. This one is pretty good, believe it or not. This is because while yes, it is a straightforward path, there is a lot of interesting set pieces like how you're driving over water with some beaches and all the mountains surrounding you. Then right when you're done with that, literally five steps to your right is the sky section. This one is also pretty good. This one is probably one of the most expansive sky sections we have seen yet. This is one of the most expansive sky sections we have seen yet, which is why it probably is so great. Like I stated in the Spellpunk library, sky sections are meant to be big and expansive since they're in the sky. It handles it basically almost perfectly. There are three big islands with birds protecting their eggs, but some trolls are trying to steal their eggs to feed to the titan's pet. So we go and shoot the trolls down an aircraft and that's it. Really not that complicated, but that's what makes it so good. It's very fast and it doesn't take up too much time. Then once we stop the eggs from getting to the Titan's pet, we must battle the Titan's pet, which is called the Terror Shark. Which I will admit it's an easy fight, which we probably didn't need, 
but something is telling me that they were trying to pad out the level links for this level. I mean, the fight isn't really bad, but it just feels unnecessary. Right after this, we go to the next land section, and it's very similar to the first one, but now they're exploding mini volcanoes all around. And dang, once we get out of the land section, we get put into the sea vehicle section because the sea area is next. So what we do is chase a crab girl down a path while she tries to attack us. Once we finish that section, we get out of the sea vehicles and have a boss fight with her, and this one is better than the terror shark, and probably the best boss battle of the level. You know, it's a lot of dodging attacks, but she does change up her fighting style every now and again, and that's really all you can ask for. And you are never going to guess what happens next. And you're never going to guess what happens after this boss. You go around a village for like one minute, then get into a land vehicle section. For this section, you go around a city destroying it, but it's okay because you're pretty sure bad guys live in those houses. There are three sections within this land portion, and walls block you off, and you have to destroy them. Once you make it all the way through the city, you can finally get to the Thunder Toe who holds the Eye of the Ancients. And after a pretty underwhelming boss battle, we get the Eye of the Ancients. I think that this level would have been so much better if they didn't have all the stakes that it did. Because if you forgot, and honestly I can't blame you if you did, this level is about finding the missing piece to the Core of Light, so the Core of Light can finally vanquish the darkness once and for all. And this level takes place during a beach where the big enemies, the titans, are idiots. It just doesn't feel like the level it should have been. An example for a level that feels like how it should have been treated is in Vault of the Ancients, which is later in this game. But if you don't count the story aspect portion of this level, the gameplay, which is the most important part I feel like, is ranked somewhere in the middle. I can think about five different levels that are better than this one, and I would place this maybe around the sixth best level. I don't think this level does a lot of wrong, but I don't think it stands out. But the only thing I do think is good is the Great Sky section. So with that, all of Monstrous Isles gets a 68 out of 100. I think I actually at one point really liked this level, but now going back to it, it's just a mediocre level at best. So we obtain the Eye of the Ancients and head back to the Academy to finally put it in the Core of Light. But right as we're about to place the Eye of the Ancients in the Core of Light, Chaos and the Sky Eater finds its way to the Academy and destroys the Core of Light. And just like that, the one thing that gave Skyler's hope is now gone. But that isn't the worst part. The worst part is what happens next. So while the Sky Eater is sucking up everything around it, it looks like the Academy won't be able to get away since there's too much weight, and Buzz says the engines are going to explode. But then Mag spots Glumshanks, and he's walking towards something. There's an island connected to the Academy, and Glumshanks pulls off the log that connects the chain to the Academy, and relieves enough weight for them to carry on. But in doing this, Glumshanks sacrifices himself, which allows the Skylanders to be able to get away before the Sky Eater eats them. Now, if you're watching this right now with no prior knowledge of superchargers, then this is probably a very sad moment as one of the nicest characters just died. And it is a very sad moment within the Skylanders series. Except I lied. Glumshanks didn't die. In fact, it almost seems like the characters know that he isn't dead, even though reasonably they all think he should be dead. But it feels like him dying wasn't even an option and everyone just assumed that he was out there somewhere and we just needed to find him. Which is really bad. Like I've said before at the end of the day, a story doesn't matter all that much to me and this aspect isn't too important in the grand scheme of things, but I do think that it's worth a mention. Because I am one of the hot take that Glumshanks should have died here. I fully think that it would have been so impactful if Glumshanks died, and I think it would have been very interesting to see what happens with Chaos. And if he doesn't die, just have him missing for most of the game, and then he shows up at the very end. And if you think him dying is too violent for a kid's game, then fine, but just don't write him off like they did, and especially don't save him in the very next chapter, because that is what ultimately happens. So let's talk about it. So after the Skylanders fix the engine on the ship that is carrying the Academy, we get a message from Pandergast. Pandergast finds Glumshanks and now he's offering him to the person that wins his games. And that is how we get the level Ridepocalypse Demo Derby, which isn't a level much like Battle Brawl Island. 
So this level is separated into three parts, and each part we're battling in our land vehicle. This level is special in the fact that it is the only level in the game that only has one land vehicle section. Because there are two levels that feature no vehicle sections, but this is the only one where it features one of them. Let's get to the first section of this level. So you hop into your land vehicle and you go in a giant circle with spikes and speed boosts in it. The first section is really easy. All you gotta do is destroy some vehicle enemies. You also have to fight a boss for each section, and this section's boss is dread roller which is just a glorified trolling thunder which we first see in the game prior to this skander's trap team not a difficult boss battle whatsoever and it's over pretty quick the interesting thing about this level is that in between sections you can exit the fighting arena and you can explore the area of the level a bit though to be fair there isn't that much of a level to explore the only thing to notice is that there's a superchargers gate but there's nothing behind it because the only thing behind it is skystone battles so i didn't bother to check out the rest of it so on to the second fight a nice touch they added is that each part of the level has a new track to it and this is explained by the sky eater eating that parts of the arena so when you go into fights they look different now when you go into the arena, there's a giant hole inside of it. You fight the same enemies except for a couple of exceptions which are not worth noting, but the boss is new. The boss's name is Turbo Teeth and it is harder than the last boss, so good job on that. Turbo Teeth moves a lot more and shoots missiles while having a spinning blade on him as well. Again though, this doesn't take any time to defeat him and we're on the last stage which is a total joke. This section has no enemies and just consists of one boss who is Rekosaurus. Now he looks really amazing, but this fight is so easy, you just have to dodge attacks which are super slow and long then all you have to do is get on the ramp and hit him on the back then the fight is over what a lackluster way to end a lackluster level i honestly have trouble calling ride apocalypse demo derby a level i mean all you do for the entirety of the level is drive and there is nothing in the actual level besides a supercharged gate that you just play sky stones in However, this is counted as a level within the game, and I can't say that the level is really fun either. And because of this, Ride Pokemon's Demo Derby scores a 50 out of 100, which effectively makes it the worst level in Superchargers. Although on the entertainment basis, it's probably not the worst, but I just can't give levels that at least attempt being levels a worst score. Gameplay-wise, it is worst, though probably, because you don't actually have any gameplay in this level. But with that, the chapter being done, we only have three more levels in this game. So why don't we take a detour for a sec to something that you may not even know about. Now, you might be asking yourself, what detour are we taking? Well, let me give some backstory. Now, each Skylanders game was released on the main consoles like the Wii, Xbox, and PlayStation. But they are also made on smaller, more portable consoles, mainly they were made on the 3DS and 2DS nowadays. And if you're wondering why there's only four games and not five, it's because I don't have giants on the 3DS. But anyway, Skyrim made a bunch of games on the 3DS. And the cool thing about these games are that they are completely different experiences. Skyrim Surprise Adventure on the 3DS is a completely different game. It has a completely different story. Swap Force as well. And mostly, I wanted to talk about this real quick. Swap Force is where, the 3DS version of Swap Force is where Moneybone actually origins from the character obviously in superchargers track team completely different game on the 3ds but guess what superchargers is also on the 3ds and you might assume that it is completely different from superchargers that we've been playing so far and that's true but this is especially different because it was also the same on the wii you see the wii had been struggling to make these more powerful games work because if you don't know, Spot Force and Trap Team are very, very buggy on the Wii, along with the graphics being not good either. So, this time around, they made the Wii game and the 3DS game the same for Nintendo consoles. So they made Super Charters Racing, where the game is entirely racing. There is no story, well there is technically a story mode, but it's all just racing, there are no levels in the game, nothing, it is all just racing. The entire game, you just race in your vehicles. Which I think is pretty cool. And, you know, I think we might actually end up liking this game a bit more than you may think so. Because, at the time of recording this video, I've already played a bit of this game. And i, I got to say, I'm liking it so far, okay? I, I think it's, it might be a diamond in the rough. Actually, all, all these 3DS games are a diamond in the rough, in my opinion. I think they're all really good. And I didn't realize that, that would look like that for that time, so let me just put this back real quick. But I think we might end up liking Superchargers a bit more now with this game. Because the thing about you know, Supercharged Racing is there is no story to really get mad about or levels to get mad about. You're just racing. 
So really the only way for this game to truly be bad is for the tracks to be bad. And we're just going to see if that's true. Anyway, I thought this would now be the perfect time in the video to talk about Superchargers Racing, since we're almost done with Superchargers, and I didn't want to talk about this after we played Superchargers, because, you know, the main point of this, you know, video is actual Superchargers, not Superchargers Racing. So I thought, you know, while we're in the end game of the game itself, I think we should just take a quick detour, This shouldn't take too, too long, to talk about the entirety of Superchargers Racing, which was released on the Wii and 3DS. Actually, something cool is that Superchargers was actually, you know, released on the Wii U. And the Wii U version of Superchargers is like Xbox and PlayStation versions. It is exactly the same as those, except you can actually play as Bowser and Donkey Kong. See, the thing about this is, yes, you can technically play as Bowser and Donkey Kong, but you can't really because you don't actually ever use your Skanders on Superchargers Racing. You just drive your vehicles, which maybe takes away from, you know, collecting the Skanders and stuff like that. But honestly, I'm having a bit of trouble putting this in. I think we're going to like this game a bit. So, let's get to talking about Superchargers Racing. Also, just in case the, you know, the lighting didn't do the, you know, the game's cover justice, I, I, I think, can you see it now? I kind of moved the light a bit. That, can you see the, the cover, the cover clearly? I'm going to have to probably do multiple takes of this if you couldn't see it. So, yeah. So there are chapters in this video, and I totally understand why you might skip this one, but I do think that talking about the 3DS version of this game is very important to the story of Superchargers, so let's get right into it. The Wii 3DS got a version of Superchargers called Skylanders Superchargers Racing, which is an entirely different game because all you do in this game is race. There is no really big story mode to it, that's the only thing you do, and it's a completely new version, so let's get right into it. And since there are a lot of tracks in this game, I'm not going to be scoring each one, I'm just going to give a brief description of each of them and go into more detail about some of the important ones. So the basic story for this game is that Pandergast has made a giant racing tournament and whoever wins the race wins the Snow Globe of Destiny, which grants the user one wish and this race takes place in Racelandia. Great naming guys. And that's the story. I mean who really needs a story for a racing game? I think it's a good time to mention while yes I have this game on the 3DS I'm using my computer to record it. Something else that should be mentioned is that each vehicle type has their own kind of powers. The land vehicles can drift like in normal games, the sea vehicles can get some airtime if they go on certain waves, and sky vehicles have a power called afterburner which makes them faster but you can't move them as easy. Also, I can finally use the Barrel Blaster and the Clown Cruiser since you can only use them on Nintendo consoles and I don't have this game on the Wii or Wii U. The first race is a Sky Vehicle race and we go to a goofy looking castle that has Pandergast's face all over it. I would say this is a pretty important track as it's the first one, but really there isn't any need to go into further detail with this track. There isn't too much to it. The next race is a pretty awesome one. You go to the Chompy Mountain, which is a callback from a level in Trap Team. For a 3DS game, this looks pretty great. You even get a cool speed boost that boosts you inside the Chompy Mountain's mouth. It is a faithful recreation of the level and a good track overall. So we've gotten a land track and a sky track, and now for the first time, the first sea track, Tropic Plunder, which is a port of a track from the main Superchargers game with a few differences. It's a pretty fun track. I just wish the first sea track was an original track, like the first land and sky racing tracks. Next is Robo Mill Forest, a sky vehicle race. And so far, this is the best track within the game. A really nice and open race for a 3DS game, and it's actually very beautiful. It is a wood mill, but it has robots in it, and what can go wrong, honestly? An awesome track. Our second land vehicle race is Trollympic Village, which gives me kind of a Chaos Castle vibes from Giants. This castle does look quite a lot similar to that level. This one is kind of an annoying track though because you have to constantly dodge these fat chompies which slows you down and getting slowed down in the race obviously isn't that fun. This one's a bit of a miss in my opinion. Our next level is our first challenge track which means it's a track that we've already seen before but there's a challenge in it instead of a race and it takes place in Robomo Forest no need to go into further detail. After you completed that challenge we beat the first world or what they call in this game a tour and there are five tours and each of them we get some sort of trophy. For finishing this tour we get the glorious cup. After we receive the cup we get a cutscene with Panergast which in this cutscene nothing happens and probably should have been better for the game if it didn't exist. The first level in our next tour is a challenge track, which takes place on Chompy Mountain where the objective is to hit speed boots. Our next track is kind of an original air track, 
It definitely takes inspiration from Calamity Canyon seen in the racing mode in Skyrim Superchargers. I mean, it's even called Cactus Canyon, basically having the same name, but it's a pretty neat race. It takes place in a canyon, obviously, with a bunch of cacti all around, and yeah, it's not cactuses, people, it's cacti. It has a bunch of the same beats from Calamity Canyon, and Calamity Canyon is one of the better races in Skyrim, so yet another great sky track. Sky races, it seems, haven't missed yet. Our next track is one of my favorites in the game, and it's Temple of Boom, a race with a sphinx with Flynn's head on it. And something interesting about this level is that it's kind of on a mountain, and most of this level is actually made out of cake materials. And I think the entire race is a nod to one sentence that Captain Flynn said in Skyner's Trap Team. So at the beginning of the Chompy Mountain level, Flynn states that he once had a mountain of his own called Mount Flynnmore, and it was entirely made out of cake. So when it rained, it washed away. You know, I had my own mountain once too. Mount Flynnmore, it was called. Turns out it was made entirely of cake though so after the first rainy season whoosh whole thing washed away just wish i'd known ahead of time i would have eaten so much more of it in my own personal headcanon this is mount flinmore the next track is a challenge track on robin mill forest i mean i like the race but again it's a challenge track which i'm not too fond of the next race is one of the more interesting ones in the series. It's called Gooey Goo Works, and the water used in this level isn't actually water. It's green goo, which again is a callback to Trap Team, when one of the Doom Raiders, Dr. Crankcase, uses green goo to power up a machine. I like this track. It has a lot of twists and turns and has some really awesome parts to it as well. Definitely the best sea track so far. Our next level is a challenge level on Mount Flynnmore. I mean, the Temple of Boom. And we get two challenge levels in a row with the next level being a challenge track on Gooey Goo Works where you hit speed boost to keep going. Like I said before, Robo Mill Forest has the best sky track yet, but that's all for nothing now because we get to Frosty Volcano, another great track. This track is half fire and half ice and wow it is amazing display for this game i mean everything is here even the fire vipers the constant change of elements really adds to the track and i mean what else can i say just look at this beauty and with that track over we complete the second tour and earn the spectacular cup we get another meaningless cutscene with pandergast and we're on to tour three and the first track of tour three is a challenge level at chompy mountain and it made me realize even more than before how much the thumb truck sucks I mean, seriously, I couldn't finish this challenge, so I eventually had to switch vehicles, but with that over, we go to the middle of nowhere. And yet again, another or great original track. Wow, Superchargers Racing is going to be better than Superchargers at this point. It does have a lot of similar beats to Frozen Fossil, which is another track seen in the racing mode of Superchargers, but it still has its own parts to it, like having a giant freaking snow yeti bathing in it. Yep, that's right, look at that. It's a giant yeti bathing right in the middle of the track. I mean, how cool is that? Now, after that amazingness, we get a challenge level, though it is probably the best challenge we've seen so far. So you're on Chompy Mountain and you have to dodge giant grenades from Trap Team. Why do things from this game keep coming from Trap Team? Anyway, giant grenades fall from the sky and you have to dodge them, and once you dodge 1,200, you complete the challenge. I feel like I keep saying this, but the next track is a great one. Octo Oasis is a C track and has everything you need. You start on a river and a giant squid from not Trap Team, but Swap Force makes an appearance along with her kids. There are also giant skeletons and there are really cool parts when you go under the giant skeletons. Overall, another great track. After this, we get a challenge level which sees us herding sheep on the Temple of Boom. And then we get another challenge level on Tropic Plunder, which is a sea vehicle version of the grenade challenge. And now this game has hit a new low because we have now hit three challenge levels in a row with a ghost race challenge on Trollympic Village. In my opinion, the game didn't really need challenge levels. This was a Wii and 3DS game after all. I don't think that many people would have cared if this game was only like three or four levels per tour. In fact, did enough people even play this game? Because I haven't really heard anyone talk about it. But most of the challenge levels are not that fun. And now it gets worse because the next level is, yet again, a challenge track. But this challenge is good, so I'm willing to excuse it. You go through Frosty Volcano with a front side view and you have to escape two fire vipers. One in the fire element and one in the ice element. And this is really awesome. Probably one of the only challenge tracks that we've seen so far that's good. But after four straight challenge tracks, we finally get an original track, which is a land race in Pander Castle Raceway, which is basically like if you took the first race, Pander Castle Skyride, and made it into a land race. Who wants to guess that there's also going to be a sea race later in the game called Pander Castle Waterway or something? I really love this track and in my opinion, the best land race we've seen yet in the game. 
It's basically an amusement park built into a race and yeah, it's awesome. This race also has the best track design so far with a lot of cool ways to move around the place. But once you complete Pander Castle Raceway, you complete the third tour and get the Marvelous Cup. Only two more tours left in the game. Sadly, Tour 4 doesn't start out strong because we have the worst land track Troll Olympic Village and it's back for a challenge track. It's a grenade challenge and I actually failed this challenge only 50 points away from completing it. And that got me really mad because it's the first time I've actually failed a challenge in a vehicle that wasn't the thumb truck. And keeping in theme with challenge tracks, the next track we have is Afterburner Mystery, a challenge track on Pander Castle Skyride. And we have another mastery challenge level in the next track because we have a drift mystery track on Temple of Boom. And finally, we have our first original track of track 4. It's a sky vehicle track called Archean Forge, and this is yet another amazing track from this game. Seriously, why couldn't superchargers have tracks like these in their racing mode? This level gives me Archean Armory vibes from Spires of Venture, and that's only my third favorite level of all time within the entire series. Something that didn't really need to be added at all, but they added anyway, is that at the very beginning of the track, you see two Archeans, and they play rock, paper, scissors each time you pass them, which is really weird, but honestly, I like it a lot. The track design is also nice and it flows really well and even better the floor is lava in some places in the level even further adding to it feeling like Arcane Armory, as well as there's a bunch of Arcanes all around the place. And something even better is that we have two original tracks in a row, with Panor Castle Water Park being our next track. We race on, and let me just say, no sea track is topping this one. This is the best sea race within the entire game. They did a really good job making this feel like a water park for a 3DS game, and it's super open. I mean, look at it. It's such a super open and expansive track. There are so many different ways to go about this level, which I really respect. I mean, there are even some giant statues of Pandergast. What else do you need? Colors are vibrant here, and everything fits together so nicely. Again, the best sea vehicle level within the entire game. But after that awesomeness, we get three back-to-back -back challenge tracks, with only one of them being good. The first one is a Sheep Wrangler mission on Pander Castle Skyway, then we're on a Cactus Canyon for a Dogfire challenge, and the only good challenge is the next one, which is a Battle Chase on Chompy Mountain. This is cool because it's another track where you face front side in the vehicle, and you shoot enemies behind you, and the big bad for this level is a giant Chompy with purple spots on it for some reason. Whatever, this mission is kinda cool, I guess. But after this track, Tor 4 is completed, and we earn the Splendorifus Cup. How do you say that? And we finally get some semblance of a story in the Racelandia wrap-up cutscene, and it shows us that Pandergast invited Chaos to one of his shows. And Chaos tells us what he'll do with the Snow Globe of Destiny if he wins it, and he says he would use it to make something called an Atomic Transmodifier Ray, which he would use to change the atoms and the underpants of everyone in Skylands and change them into itchy cactus underpants. And with all that going on, he would conquer Skylands. Honestly, coming from Chaos, it sounds right. So now we know that there's actually a villain for this game. Cool. But none of that matters because the best track in the entire game, heck, the entire Supercharger saga is the next track. Because we are going to Grill X's Big Barbecue. If you have any knowledge of Skylanders, you know who Drill X is. Well, his brother is here now and he can't wait to cook up some hamburgers. The track is also awesome with its food theme, and it still manages to look somewhat menacing even though you're hopping over steak and dodging carving forks. Another great thing about this level is that there's giant machetes that chop up and down in certain areas of the track, and if one chops down, it will block your path and you have to choose another path. And you kind of have to calculate when the blades will go down and choose which path you should take. So my Streamlabs decided to crash for some reason, and most of the gameplay from Tor 5 I no longer have. But uh, that's actually okay because Grill X was actually the last race of the game. That's right, after Grill X, which is the first track in Tor 5, there are no more original races. But let's just go over the challenge tracks that we missed. There was a dogfight challenge in the Arcane Forge, a stunt mastery in Octoasis, a Chompy Geddon in Pander Gassel Raceway, a Ghost Race in Archean Forge, there was back-to-back -back challenge levels in Grill X's Big Barbecue, the first is a Sheep Wrangling mission, and the next being a Ghost Race, which I have footage of. It was really easy, but that is the penultimate track of this game because our next track is our last. So we load into Pander Castle Skyride, and we see Pander Gas's flow. But Chaos has taken over it, and he is chasing us, and we must shoot him down. And this actually takes a bit longer than I thought it would, mostly because he shoots up a force field every now and again, and then you defeat him and the game is over. Then we get one more cutscene. Once the game is over, since Skylanders are never shown in cutscenes, Flynn must take the Snow Globe of Destiny on our behalf, and he wishes for a giant enchilada. It doesn't work at first, and he says it's a fake, and Pandergast, afraid he just got busted for giving away a fake prize, runs away, only for us to see a giant enchilada fall from the sky in the background. 
And for the most part, that's it for Skyner Superchargers Racing. Now, there are a couple challenge levels that I didn't go over and some elemental gate things to do, but really, that's it. Now, you can also use the Sea, Land, and Sky expansion packs, but they're all the same ones in the actual Superchargers games just ported down. They even got rid of one race per expansion pack. You only get two new levels now instead of three new races. But actually, there is one more level to play. Because for whatever reason, they made one of the races in the sea expansion pack exclusive to Superchargers Racing. So let's take a look at it real quick. So let's put on the sea expansion pack and take a look at this exclusive race. This track is called Risky Rapids and it's another Archean themed race. It's your average looking rapid river with Archeans all over it and the highlight of this track is when you go up a waterfall and go inside of an Archean's mouth. That is particularly awesome. And you also get some air time if you take certain paths during this track. Overall I'd say it's one of the better tracks within the game. If I'm being honest, I really ended up enjoying Superchargers Racing, probably way more than I should have had. And that's probably because Superchargers Racing understood the assignment. It is a game meant for racing, and it does just that. It gives you racing. Now, this game, I probably wouldn't replay. Probably not, but then again, it is a game that was made for the Wii and 3DS because it couldn't handle a ported down version of the actual game. So I think it did a good enough job. Now, I haven't played all of the 3DS games, so I don't know how it ranks among the other games. But I mean, I guess it would be the worst 3DS game since all the other ones are actual Skylanders games. Because at the end of the day, this isn't a Skylanders game. It's a racing game with Skylanders in it. But you do feel those Skylanders themes within the game, which makes it fit in with those other games, which is all you can really ask for. And it was nice to finally play as Bowser and Donkey Kong's vehicles. So my main issue with Superchargers Racing is that the race levels feel very few and far between as the game goes on. For example, in Tour 5 there's only one new racetrack, which was Grill X's Big Barbecue. So in total there are 15 races, with 5 per vehicle type, which if I do my math correctly, that means there should be enough for 3 new races in each new tour. But instead what they did was really weird. So in Tour 1 there are 5 new races, already around 30% of the game is over with the first tour. Tour 2 has 4 new races, so by the end of Tour 2, you've completed 9 out of the 15 races. Tour 3 consists of 3 new races, Tour 4 brings us 2 new races, and like I said, Tour 5 has 1. My question is, why? Wouldn't it have been so easy to just sort out these races and give us an equal amount of races in each tour, or give us less tours but more races in each tour? And I care about this because those challenge tracks get really repetitive after a while, and I don't think anyone would have cared if this game was only 15 races long. Or, you know, instead of making those challenge tracks, they could have focused on making new races and stuff like that. And if you count the expansion packs, there are 21 races, but only 16 new ones. And now, let's really quickly rank all the Superchargers racing tracks. Coming in at number 16, we have the only track from the game that I really strongly dislike, and it is Troll Olympic Village. That's right, I think this is the only big miss that the game has. The design of the track itself isn't that creative and the giant chompies are pretty annoying. 15 places, Pander Castle Skyride. The only Pander Castle track that won't be ranking high. This track just feels like the most bland out of any of the Sky tracks. It's not bad though, but truly Big Village is bad. Now after this, it was really hard to rank the rest because they're all good tracks, but at 14th place is Chompy Mountain. I still think this is a great race, but sadly I do think now that Trolley Olympic Village is out of the rankings, Choppy Mountain became the weak link of the land levels. Still an awesome track though. 13th place is the first sea vehicle race with Tropic Plunder. The main reason why it ranks this low is because it's not an original Superchargers racing level, but a ported down version of one from Superchargers. Coming in at 12th is Middle Snowware. The part where you pass the giant bathing yeti is great, but other than that, it is your standard sea vehicle track. 11th is home to Cactus Canyon, and when you first play it, it seems like one of the better tracks in the game, but as you play more and more of the tracks, it becomes less and less better. Though, this is still a good race. At 10th place, we have Temple of Boom. Flynn's Sphinx Head will haunt me in my nightmares, a fun track with a fun theme with a cake theming. 9th has the only sea vehicle section where water isn't used, Gooey Goo Works. A very interesting track and a very creative one if I do say so myself. This would rank higher, but C vehicle tracks are stacked, so it's 9th. 
Eighth place, now halfway through the mini ranking, is Roba Milforce, one of the better races during the beginning of the game, and it still holds up. Seventh place is Frosty Volcano, a super visually appealing level, I mean, just look at it, half ice, half fire is super cool in this race. Sixth is Pander Castle Raceway. This track is unique as there's not a lot of borders, so you can fall right off it, and there are a lot of turns and twists on this ride. Fifth place is the only expansion track on this list, Risky Rapids, a jungle river filled with a bunch of Archeans. I love Arkeans, so this is always going to rank high, but they do the Arkeans justice in this level because they look huge and monstrous, which they are. At fourth place, we have our last Sky Vehicle track, Arkean Forge, another Arkean theme level. This track truly makes you feel like you're in the Arkeans' home, wherever that may be. A very exceptional track. Alright, we're in the top three, with the bronze medal going to Octoasis. Something I like about this track is all the forks in the roads, but you have to look out if some parts of the water are covered in ink, which will slow you down. This track always keeps you on your feet. Second place hosts our last sea vehicle race, Pander Castle Water Park. This race feels like one giant water slide and I'm here for the entire ride. Like most of the best races in the game, this race features multiple paths that you can take and you also get some awesome airtime within this track. And finally, our number one spot, you already know what it is, Grill X's Big Barbecue. I don't need to say anything, you know this is going to be number one. Also, look at Grill X dance with you in the end of the race. I hope he's having a great time flipping those burgers. But now we're done with this section of the video. I did think it was important to talk about Supercharger's sister game. I will say I was a bit surprised by how much I ended up liking this game. For some reason, I thought it was actually kind of cool. For a game I had very low expectations going into, I can happily say that Supercharger's racing in every way surpassed my expectations. But we're not going to talk about the actual game of Superchargers just yet, because I have one more thing that I'd like to talk about before we finish Skylanders Superchargers. Oh, it's finally time we got to the video. The part of the video where we're talking about the timeline. Oh my God, the timeline, because Superchargers changes everything. I've been theorizing about this timeline for so long. All right, now the Conspiracy Gamer TV is out of the way. Let's talk about the timeline, because he was right about one thing. Superchargers does change everything about the timeline. Up until, and also <laughs> post-production me, put, put up the games over here, timeline-wise, you know? Okay, so for the first four games, it, it kind of makes sense with how it goes. You know, it makes sense in Superchargers, I mean, sorry, it makes sense that Trap Team comes after Swap Force, it makes sense that Swap Force comes after Giants, and it makes sense that Giants comes after Spyro's Adventure. With a tad a tiny continuity error between Swap Force and Trap Team that I think can be explained away. So a lot of people talk about how, okay, in Swap Force at the very end, the volcano erupts and it turns Chaos and Glumshanks into Swappers, and they swap tops and bottoms. And, you know, they're like, oh my god, they're freaking out because they swap tops and bottoms. And in Trap Team, they're back to normal. And everyone was kind of like, okay, well, why is that? Shouldn't they be in their swap forms? But I think this can be actually very easy to explain the way. In Swap Force, in the very beginning, like 100 years before Swap Force takes place, the Swap Force gets, the Swap Force get inside the volcano, it erupts, and they swap. But the Swap Force can swap back and forth. So it isn't really that big of a stretch to say that, okay, well, they can, the Chaos and Glimchings can swap back and forth. So I think that they probably just swap back to normal. They never talk about it again. And we also know that Swap Force has to come after Giants. Because at the very end of Giants, Chaos comes back, goes back to his castle and he's all sad because he just lost. And you see the shadow of Chaos's mom. So it makes sense that she is in the, the next game. And because of process of elimination, that means the Spires Adventure has to take place before Giants. So yeah, Spires Adventure comes first, Giants comes second, Swap Force comes third, and Trap Team comes fourth. But then it gets kind of weird from there. So, at the very end of Trap Team, Chaos gets trapped. He's good now, but in Superchargers, he's all of a sudden evil again. And even more, in Superchargers, there's a bunch of villains on the loose as well. The Golden Queen, Wolfgang, characters like that are actually back in Superchargers, and they're not trapped, and you have to defeat them again to play as them in their vehicles. So it's kind of like, okay, well, maybe you can say that Superchargers happened before Trap Team, but you can't, because the darkness is still a very big thing in Trap Team that they talk about in Trap Team. And they can't, you know, not talk about it because superchargers, you get rid of the darkness. And even if you wanted to say, okay, let's forget about the darkness. Let's say that superchargers happened before Trap Team. That still just wouldn't make sense with everything we know about the series. So where does superchargers fit 
into all of this. Now I know someone's probably saying, okay, well, they explain how chaos is out of the trap in a comic book. If it happens in a comic book, to me, it's not canon because I don't read the comic books. So there you go. So right now we kind of have this weird time on events. It even gets weirder with Imaginators because at the very end of Superchargers, Chaos can't be evil anymore because the darkness is gone. See, without the darkness, Chaos can't actually be evil. So it's kind of like, all right, what do we do now? Because in Imaginators, Chaos is bad again. So it's like, well, what the heck happened? So it sets up all this weird continuity here. People have been trying to make stuff about the timeline again. And another thing is, if you really want to say Superchargers comes before Trap Team, or even Swap Force, you still can't, because if you say Superchargers happens before Swap Force, Tess is a very apparent character in Superchargers, and she obviously is found in Swap Force. So we know that the first three games, at least, are all in chronological order. That is, that, that is pretty much set in stone. But Trap Team, Superchargers, and Imaginators... They can all happen in really any, any random given order. Another thing that's really weird about this, though, is that I think Imaginators has to happen last, since you can play as villains in that game that are senseis that are rehabilitated. So there you go. All right, so let's say that the first three games have to happen in chronological order how they did. Let's say that Spiders of Adventure has to take place first, Giants has to take place second, and Swap Wars has to take place Third, I know I kind of said Trap Team has to take place fourth, but I think that one's a bit more, you know, you can move pieces around like that. And let's say Imaginators has to happen last. Okay, well, that means where does Trap Team and Superchargers fit in the timeline? And they don't. They don't fit in the timeline. Trap Team cannot happen, or Imaginators can't happen after Superchargers. And from basically everything I know, Superchargers can't play, take place after Trap Team. So where do we go from here? Well, there's one theory that basically everyone talks about. It's the split timeline theory. So basically what everyone says is that after the events of Trap Team, Super, the Skyler series splits up into two different timelines where Matthews happens in one of the timelines and Supercharges happens in the other timeline. That's something that most people talk about, but I don't really like that because it's kind of like a, a, you know, a cheat code. It's like, okay, well, we're going to say there are different timelines, something like that. Although it does make sense, especially the Imagine is one. Actually, really, imagine this taking place after the Trap Team is basically almost perfect. It, it really is, because in Imaginators, Chaos is still evil, and that is obviously a part that, you know, still doesn't make sense. But without that part, everything else makes sense. The Senseis being in Imaginators after Trap Team, that makes sense. And everything else makes sense. The only part that really comes into this is the events of Trap Team, where Chaos gets trapped. That part messes up with everything, honestly, the chaos getting trapped part, but let's just kind of forget that now. So the main theory is that, like I already said, the first four games happen in chronological order, and then the last two games happen in two set different timelines. And, you know, I guess that makes sense, but I don't really like that. I think that's a, a cheat code. So I'm still trying to figure out how can superchargers and trap team and imaginators all happen in the same timeline and it to make sense. This isn't really like a timeline theory, but I've always had a fun little theory that every single Skyrim's game actually happens in their own set universe. So like, Spirals of Adventure and Spirals of Adventure and 3DS happens in its universe. Giants and Giants and 3DS happens in a separate universe. You know, you know what I'm saying? Because like, the, it kind of makes sense honestly for that, because a lot of the games actually have continuity as there was like very small ones, but like that, especially the later games. But that's like always a fan theory I've had. They actually all just take place in different universes. But this part of the video is trying to find out the best way for the timeline to work. Now, my first theory about the timeline has a lot of different moving parts. So let's get into it. So fan theory for me, number one, is that Superchargers is actually the very first game, in the timeline at least, but it splits off into two universes. One, where the darkness is defeated and everyone's all good, and there's no other games after that. And the second one is that in another timeline, Superchargers, in the, the events of Superchargers, the darkness isn't defeated, and they just defeat chaos, but the darkness is still present. Obviously, that, you know, it, it, it kind of works, right? So branching off from superchargers, we just have SSA, Swap Force, Giants, Trap Team, and then Imaginators. I think that one's solid enough to say superchargers the first game, and they split off on two different timelines where one of them just, none of the games exists, and it's just all good. And the other one with the darkness survives the events of, of superchargers. I like to think that, like, maybe in, you know, 
there's a universe where, like, in the Adventures of Chargers, the, the darkness pretends he gets defeated. Like, the very end of the game, the darkness pretends he gets defeated. But he doesn't, and he's still around. So, like, that's why, like, you know, it's kind of shocking to see chaos. And he's like, what happened to your fate? Whatever. And that theory would most often, would, like, actually work if it wasn't for Tessa. See, Tessa has to come first in Swap Force. There cannot be a game where Tessa exists before Swap Force, because they meet her in Swap Force, which means that Trap Team and Superchargers and Imaginators all have to happen after Swap Force. So that messes up that theory. So that means that the final three games are the final three games. Imagine your Superchargers and Trap Team are the final three games. They have to be, because Tess is present in those games, and she gets introduced in Swap Force. So we know that at least the first three games, like I already said, have to happen in that way. You can't really do anything about it. I know that fan theory didn't have a lot of solid ground on it, but let's continue. I think another one that you can maybe argue with is that the timeline goes Spires Adventure, Giants, Swap Force, Superchargers, Trap Team Imaginators. It being like, you know, you technically can play as the villains, but they never really say that they're trapped in you know, superchargers, so like they can still be bad in trap team, you can trap them, you can place them in imaginators, yada yada. But this is the part you guys probably aren't gonna like. There is no timeline, because it doesn't make sense no matter what. I know this might be a letdown, but honestly, I don't really think there's a way for the timeline to work. And probably the best one that you can go with is just the games that they were made in chronological order. The best, I think, way you can make the timeline work is if you have Spazmatcher so first, Giant second, Swap Force third, Trap Team fourth, Superchargers fifth, and Imaginator six. Because for the most part, every single game works besides Superchargers and Trap Team. Those games don't happen. All the other games really make sense. And if you actually get rid of Superchargers, it makes sense with, you know, so as to say, Giant, Swap Force, Trap Team, and Imaginators. And that's my final act, my, my final one, is that Superchargers exist in a universe by itself, and the rest of the games happen in chronological order. That, that, that's my theory, my timeline theory. Superchargers happens in a completely different timeline where none of the events of the previous games happen, and then the rest of the games happen in that order. As far as Adventure comes first, because it just comes first, Giants come second. We know that Swap Force has to come after Giants because of the Chaos and Mom scene. And we know that Trapping has to come after Swap Force because Chaos and Glumptions switch back. And then it makes sense from Trapping to go straight to Imaginators. I don't think really, I, I really like this theory more than the split timeline theory because I think that theory, like, yeah, you can technically say that these two are in different timelines, but I think actually it really works better if Superchargers and it is an entire universe by itself because. Chaos, for some reason, is way more buffed in that universe. He has way more powers. He can make the Sky Eater. He can capture the Skylands, uh, capture the Skylanders, which is something he could never do. But for some reason, Superchargers, he can. I think it works best if Superchargers is just by itself, and that is the only game that actually happens in its timeline. Maybe some events can kind of happen in other games. But for the most part, this is the timeline, in my opinion. These five games right here all happen in chronological order, and then you can just have up here Superchargers and its own multiverse, which means that this entire video, and my this entire video, if my theory is correct, we're talking about not the fifth game in a game series, we're talking about the first game in a game series, because Superchargers can only work if it's in a universe by itself. So, boom. That's the timeline, everyone. The timeline is first swap. Uh, I'm sorry. The timeline is first Spires Adventures, second Giants, third Swap Force, fifth, or sorry, fourth <laughs> Trap Team, and fifth Imaginators. And then Supercharged is by its own some in another universe. Thank you for this part of the video that you just watched. Yeah. Okay, now that that's finally over, we can finally talk about the end of superchargers.
So where we last just left off, we saved Glumshanks from Pandergast. When we get back to the Academy, Hugo asks Eon if there's any way to defeat the darkness, which Eon replies with no. Geez, thanks you useless old man. However, he says that if we can't destroy the darkness, we should try to send it back to where it came from. Kali brings up the Dark Rift engine, since that is what brought the darkness here, so maybe it can get rid of it too. Unfortunately, Eon doesn't know where the rift is. Geez, why did we save this guy? Thankfully, Glumshanks, in a strange turn of events, knows where the engine is because the darkness talks in his sleep about it. So Glumshanks tells us it's in a hidden place called the Vault of the Ancients, a place where the ancients have locked away things that are too dangerous to be used by mere mortals. So we hop on Sharp Fin ship and we go there. So opening thoughts on this level is that it's one of the most visually appealing levels within the entire series of Skylanders. Even the opening land section, you can see the beauty of this chapter. But speaking of the first land section, the gimmick for this level is push and pull magnetism, which is used in the land section here. You need to get different parts of the goat statue that have fallen off, and the way to do that is you turn on your pull magnet to connect them to you, and once you're finished with that, the actual level begins. You enter the Vault of the Ancients, which wow is super beautiful. This level reminds me of Quicksilver Vault, and Quicksilver Vault is my favorite level of all time within the Skander series, so off to a good start. We also use push and pull methods inside the vault as well to open doors and move platforms. Something interesting about this level is that enemies also are affected by the magnets, so you can push and pull them away from you. Some enemies can only be defeated if using a magnet in a certain way. Anyway, onto the sky section of the level, and this may be my favorite one from the looks alone. I mean, this is crazy. Such a calming place in my opinion, and a nice break from a level. Whoa! For the first time, a good break in the level for a vehicle section. The challenge itself, however, isn't hard. Yes, my high volt died, but that's because he only had 63 health before going through this section. I was a bit sad when the sky section ended. Truly the best sky section in the entire game. Nothing is beating that. After we complete the section, we go through more enemies and we get another magnet puzzle where basically what you have to do is either use push or pull to move the magnet story path until it gets to the end of the path. Once you complete the puzzle, a door opens and you exit the first vault, and then we get to our second land section. This one's pretty cool. You need to use your push magnet to push magnetic bombs away from you. This is another very good looking track and when you get to the end you have to use push or pull to move a gigantic magnetic wrecking ball to hit chimes, kind of like in the sky section. After we hit the chimes a door opens and you can go into the second vault. I know I keep saying it but wow this vault is great looking. This vault also uses push and pull magnetism for platforming, way more than before, and I like it. I think the gimmick was used to its fullest inside of this level. Once we are done platforming, we get to our sea vehicle section. This is yet another awesome vehicle section at this level. Dang, this chapter has done it all, hasn't it? The first part is a bit slow, but I still enjoyed it. You get to move some magnetic puzzles in the first part, but once we get to the second part, this vehicle section really gets in the gear. See what I did there? The sunset looks amazing through all the ancient buildings. Really just awesome. You go down a water hill and then into some more puzzles. Then you kind of just swim around through the vault and battle some enemies. And one last set of puzzles after that. Once you do this, the lights turn in the vault, making the blue lights into gold, which, oh my gosh, I didn't think this level could look any more stunning, but I was wrong. I don't know what it is about the gold lighting, but I think it actually fits the level more than the blue lighting, so good job. We also get these new magnetic platform parts. They are kind of hard to explain in words, but I think they are like rifts that can push you forward or backwards. And if you are in a 2D platforming section, they can put you up and down. Once you complete these rift sections, you get a third land section where you have to defeat some enemies, then do three magnet puzzles and the level is over and we obtain the dark rift engine. Okay, so that was at least for me, undoubtedly the best level in this game. No level is topping this. No level is even going close to touching this level. I mean, every single vehicle section in this level is good. The actual level itself isn't shortened by these vehicle sections and still is a great level with no vehicle portions. The chapter looks amazing when the level lighting is blue and gold. The gimmick is well realized and works for the entire level. I mean, even the enemies are used for this gimmick and everything fits together so nicely. If you remember, I said that this level reminds me so much of Quicksilver Vault, which at the end of the day, could be the reason why I like it so much. But at the same time, I do think this level does enough to make it different from Quicksilver Vault to make it still feel like a different level. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised though if Vault of the Ancients and Quicksilver Vault were related in some sort of way. But like I already said, this level is the best within the game. And we still have two levels left to review. So it's all downhill from here. Anywho... This chapter is scoring a 90 out of 100. 
which means it's a top 20 level of all time within the Skander series. But after that amazing showing from this game, I can only feel like we're about to be let down by what comes next. But we are now officially in the end game of Superchargers, with only two levels left. Let's get to it. So once we get back to the academy, Max is trying to get the Dark Rift engine to work, but it's making a lot of noise and a lot of light, and Buzz is worried that it'll give away the location of the academy. And it does, because Sky Bandits raid the academy. And while Buzz is talking about how we need to defend the academy, I'm pretty sure he makes a Snakes on a Plane reference. Get these Sky Bandits off my island! We defeat the Sky Bandits, but we find out that they capture Mags and we need to find her. We chase down the bandits and we find their bandit train that they are on. This is one of the shorter levels, only being about 14 minutes long. This is because this is the second only level in the game where there are no vehicle sections and it's just a regular level. I just wish they could make the levels with no vehicles like actual levels because both Battle Brawl Island and the Bandit Train don't really come off as levels, but more like side missions. Anyway, we track down the Bandit Train and hop on to the back of it. There isn't much to do in this chapter, but you go through a bunch of different train engine rooms until we get to the end. I guess I'll go over all the different rooms. The first room has a key in the middle of it, and you have to jump onto two different moving platforms to get to it. The next room, you have to move puzzle blocks to make an engine work so you can move on. Our next room is just a cargo room with enemies in it, and you have to defeat them all. The next section is a 2D platforming one, and all you have to do is jump on a bunch of different moving platforms. To exit, you jump on a bounce pad, and you fall into the next area. When you enter, it is a dark room, and you can't see because it's an ambush and one of the enemies has the key to the next room. The next room is another 2D platforming place. Then the next section of the train is just a break room, nothing in it, and Persephone is here in case you want to upgrade a couple Skylanders. We get another block puzzle after that room, and it's just a bit more complicated than last time. And speaking of a bit more complicated than last time, we get another 2D platforming section that has smoke in it, so it's harder to see now. We get a mini boss fight in the next room, and it gives us the key to go to the next room, which is a giant room with a bunch of moving platforms and hiding in this room is a key. It took me way longer to find this key than it should have. Then we get to the last 2D platforming room. Then another block puzzle, but this time it's in the dark. Ooh, spooky. <laughs> we get one more ambush fight, we get one last engine block puzzle, one more moving platform section, but this one's in the dark. I know, very spooky. Then we get finally to the captain of the ship, Blubberbeard who is standing on top of Mag's cage that she has been captured on. We have to fight Blubberbeard's minions, then we have to fight Blubberbeard himself, and it's anticlimactic as it sounds. We free Mag's and we head back to the academy. Now that I actually listed off every single room, there are way more train compartments that you have to go through than I remembered. The thing is though, most of these rooms are nothing rooms and take only a couple seconds to finish. If you want to know, the number of rooms in this level is 17, and some of them are very repetitive. I mean, this level is only 14 minutes, which is about like 2 or like 1.5 compartments per minute. I don't know. This is why it doesn't feel like a level though, because most ones can at least come close to reaching 30 minutes. This one would never come close to reaching 30 minutes. This level feels way more like a side mission. I don't know if most people will know what I'm talking about, but in Skylanders Imaginators, there's this part of the game where you have to do a bunch of mini levels to collect parts for a cake so you can make chaos a cake to hide in the ambush them in. But none of those areas you go to are counted as levels because they're side missions. To me, the Bandit Train is just a glorified side mission. So that is why it scores a 65 out of 100. But now that the Bandit Train is over, we're moving on to the last level of Skylanders Superchargers. I know it's weird that we're finally almost over with the game. So let's finish this thing once and for all. So after you complete the bandit train, we get a pretty important cutscene that develops Chaos a bit more. Chaos is talking to himself inside the Sky Eater and is talking about how he won and should be happy, yet he isn't. Then all of a sudden, a figment of Chaos' imagination in the form of Glumshanks appears. Ghost Glumshanks tells Chaos his destiny is to rule Skylands, but his plan now is to rule the universe, but in order to rule the universe, he needs to destroy Skylands, thus destroying his own destiny. But now, in order to rule the entire universe, you'll first need to destroy Skylands, thus destroying your own destiny. And I don't want to do that? You tell me. I'm just a figment. A voiceover in the Sky Eater comes on saying that the sky consumption is at 98%. 
then imaginary Glumshinks goes away. But now with a push of a button, Chaos can destroy Skylands, but at the same time he would destroy all that he has worked for in the past four games previous to this. So Chaos sits and thinks, and the cutscene ends. Something that I will admit that I do really like about Superchargers is that it develops the main villain, Chaos, in a way that no other game could. Chaos is now forced into a position where, yes, he could control the entire universe, but at the same time, what's the point if he can't control Skylands, the very thing he's wanted to do since the very beginning? So you see him really think if he actually wants to follow the darkness or go by himself to make his own destiny. It's a very interesting story throughout the game, as you see Chaos reconsider what he's doing more and more, and after the last chapter, we'll see what he ultimately decides to do. Like I mentioned before, Superchargers is the most story-driven game. See what I did there? And really, it's not even close. This is definitely the game with the most story in it. But let's see where that story leads us. So I kind of have to like put my camera kind of like an awkward position. I have to put on a lamp, like my camera's on a lamp right now. Um, but I, I really like this shot. So I'm gonna go with it anyway. This is a real quick section I want to do called Things I Forgot. Now, if you watch another YouTuber called Quentin Reviews, and he, I got this from him. Um, you know, I'm borrowing this idea kind of. <laughs> so basically, he made a video about iCarly, I and like near the end of it, he added this section where he would just list off things that were important that he forgot to mention. And there are a couple of things I think that are important that I also forgot to mention. Um, so real quick, I just want to kind of list off some things that we probably should have talked about, but we didn't. So the first one, I'm actually... Super surprised I never talked about it, but uh, for some reason in the academy, and this doesn't happen in levels, this doesn't happen uh, anywhere else, I don't think it happens in side missions, just the academy, NPCs will just wear hats. Like hats that you collect within the game, you'll just see like an NPC, like, like Flynn wearing like a stupid like pink hat, you know? It's really weird. Like you'll be like in a, like even like in like a really important cutscene, like a really like, um, like, not, not cutscene, doesn't happen cutscene, but, like, in a very, like, important dialogue part of the story, like, a really dark part of the story, they're given dialogue, and they'll just be wearing, like, stupid hats. Um, I didn't look up why this is. Maybe it's, some game developers probably like, oh, well, you know, a lot of people don't have, the, a lot of people don't use hats. Like, a lot of people, I, this is what I think it is. And it's probably online if I look it up, but I'm not going to look it up. This is what it probably is. It's probably because people don't wear hats in Skanders. I, I don't normally see people that play Skanders that put hats on the Skanders. Because you can find hats in like Elemental Gates and stuff like that in previous games. And you can find hats in like Presence and stuff like that you can find in this game. And a lot of people don't wear hats. So I think the way they, they, they wanted to keep hats in the game. But the best way for them to do that is for uh, was for them to put them on NPCs. So like, hey, here's your hats that you collected, but you don't wear. So we're going to put them on NPCs instead. So you can see all the hats you collected. I'm like, I don't know if there's like an option in the settings to turn off hats. Maybe there is. I don't know. Um, I would do that personally if there is. Because, I mean, it's really dumb. Like, you know, it's really stupid. All right. So this is another one that I think is like really weird. But um, you can't 100% superchargers. There is no option or like thing in the main menu that says that you 100% superchargers. You can get to Portal Master rank 75, which is like not, you can do that without like getting everything in superchargers like in every hat. But yeah, there's no option like next to your save file that says 100% or like whatever percent of the game you completed, which is really weird because even Swap Force, the other game by Carrie's Vision is made has this. You can 100% Swap Force, you can 100% Spires Adventure, you can 100% Giants, you can 100% Trap Team, you can 100% Imaginators, but you can't 100% Superchargers. The, like I said, the, the thing that you can get, that gets you, like, you can kind of say you 100% you 100 of Superchargers is saying that you got to Portal Master rank 75. Because in, um, in like this, and this is another thing I wanted to mention that I forgot, there's like this new way of like going about things. So like, um, when you go through the game, you can open up presents, chests, and stuff like that. And inside some of them, you get like this Portal Master XP, which goes on your Portal Master rank. And each time you rank up, you can like get things like um, like characters of the Dark Element, you know, get more gold, or like you get more gold from opening chest, or you know, you know, Dark Vehicles attack, stuff like that. And that once you rank up to your Portal Master rank all the way, like then you should technically like have basically gotten everything you need to do 
but you can't 100% the game. There's like these things called medals in the game, which are like achievements, uh, but you can't like, you can't 100% the game. Now, if you're on Xbox or PlayStation, you can technically 100% the game because there's like, you know, on Xbox, there's like Xbox achievements and stuff like that. So like you can have on Xbox settings, like, oh, you go to Xbox, you look at games, um, you 100% superchargers, but it won't say you 100% superchargers within the game. This is another big one that I can't believe I forgot to talk about, but elemental gates don't exist anymore. Um, yeah. And every other game before this, Inspires Adventure, Giant, Swap Force, Trap Team, there'd be like these sections you can go into that you can only get into if you have a certain character of a certain element, or in Trap Team's case, a Trap Master of a certain element. Superchargers? Nope. Doesn't exist. Now, there are these things called, um, uh, like, vehicle gates, kind of, where you can enter them if you have a certain vehicle of a certain element, um, but those don't count for anything towards the level, it doesn't count 100% of the game because you can't 100% of them. So I don't really count them as, you know, um, as like elemental gates. Now, there are these things called superchargers gates, which you can only go into if you have a supercharger character. And I think these things are basically the like, you know, um, the equivalent to elemental gates. You can only go through them if you have a supercharger character, though. So like if you have like a, you know, a Spitfire, you can go into this gate. And it's like basically just like an extra part of the level. Like elemental gates usually look like like water, like it looks like, oh, okay, it's there, you're in like a water section, life, okay, you're in a life section, magic, you're in a magic section. These just look like extra parts of the level that weren't in it, you know? Um, but yeah, elemental gates don't exist. It's like a big thing. Elemental gates are in every other game and they're just not here in superchargers. Okay, this is another one that's pretty important. Hugo is back in this game. So if you don't know, Hugo is one of the main NPCs in Spires Adventure and he just is basically absent from every other game. In Giants, he's in the very opening like cutscene. He tells Flynn about the Giants, but it never shows up. In Swap Force, again, he's in the very opening cutscene. He says something from like hi or goodbye, something like that. Um, but he never you never see him again. In Trap Team, he's in the very opening cutscene. In the very I think he's I'm pretty sure he's in the very last cutscene, but he's not in the game at all. But in Superchargers, he plays like a, a massive role. He um you know he's a character, one of the first characters you talk to. Before you save Eon, he actually says which characters are stronger in, in which zone. You know, like when you play Ray, like let's say you play like Swap Force, Eon, would, like when an Earth Skander was, you know, more powerful in the zone, Eon would always be like, Skanders of the Earth element are stronger in the zone. Um, Hugo does that for the first four levels where Eon is not present. So yeah, Hugo is back. He plays a very important role. And then Imaginator's next game after this, he just, he disappears again. He's not there. Um... Which is funny. He the only games he was really ever present in was Spider Adventure and Superchargers. But yeah, um, Hugo's back basically. This is one that's like maybe not a lot of people care about, but I think it was important enough to talk about. Nicknaming is gone. So basically, in um, every other game before this, you could like nickname your Skanders. So, like you can nickname like let's say Boomer Dynamite. You know, um, but in Superchargers that's gone. So if you like were to like have a Boomer that you nicknamed Dynamite and put him in a Superchargers, his name would register as Boomer. Don't know why they did this. Really isn't that important. Um, but it's just, just kind of there, you know? Just just kind of there. Kind of surprised we didn't talk about this one either, but the hub world of um, Superchargers is a blatant copy of Trap Team. It's basically the same thing. Uh, it's it's the Academy. It's just the Academy again, but now it's like more run down and stuff. So there's that. And it's just kind of weird that they just kind of cloned it, you know? It's whatever though. Like hub world's... I don't think it's really that important in games, but it's just kind of something I thought would be worth a mention. So this one's more maybe like a trivia, but fact, but like there are no dragons in this game. No character is a dragon. Now, I think technically Spitfire is a dragon, but he's not four legs, so I don't count it. There are no four-legged Skanders in this game. And it makes sense because, you know, um, you have to drive and stuff like that. But this is the only game where there is no four-legged creatures. Now, I think the main reason why pop Fizz was in this game and not spyro was because he has feet and hands and spyro only has feet so it'd be kind of hard to make spyro like drive it really wouldn't though it really wouldn't be that hard to have spyro drive and if i'm being honest pop Fizz was probably just a more popular character at the time and i think that you know activision as a whole wanted to kind of move away from spyro being the main character and stuff like that and wanted to focus on someone else. And if they brought Spyro back for this game, that is further just demonstrating that Spyro still was a very big part of this game. 
And um, so I think they that's one of the reasons. And I think also because they would have been kind of hard to make Spyro drive a uh, water vehicle because magic is water in this game. But yeah, there's no dragon characters in this game. No four-legged creatures. Really weird. And then there's also a uh, there's a new Sky Stones game. So anyone who plays Skystones knows what Sky Stones is. And there's this new vo- version called Sky Stones Overdrive where it's basically the same thing as Trap Team uh, Sky Stones, but there are pieces that have like um, that are like very they're only in superchargers. And there's also this part called Overdrive where um, if you get like enough points or something like that. You, your vehicle that you're currently using becomes a Skystone, and they're like the most powerful Skystone you can get, kind of. All right. Is there anything else that I should have talked about, but I didn't? I can't think of any. All right. That's it. That's the end of this little subsection of the video called Things I Forgot. Let's get back to the regular video. So Buzz announced that all there is left to do is to bring the fight to Chaos, and we head over to the Sky Eater. We get out of the cutscene basically right where we left off, and Chaos is looming over the big red button, struggling to push it as it would start destroying what is left of Skylands. The Darkness gets annoyed by Chaos not being able to press the button, so the Darkness brings up that he has given Chaos a lot, but he can also take away. And he takes away Chaos's weird thing that he has on his forehead, which takes away his powers. What are you doing? Perhaps you've forgotten how much the darkness has given you, and how easily it can be taken away. Ah! My thing! What did you do to my powers? So, Chaos is forced to press the button if he wants his powers back, so he does press it and the darkness gives him his powers back, along with his weird thing on his head. But now the destruction of Skylands has started, and the Skylanders only have a limited amount of time to defeat Chaos and the darkness. So, how do we start the finale of Superchargers? A mediocre sky section. Great. Because we need to find a way into the Sky Eater, the plan is to destroy a little moon right next to the Sky Eater and shove it into the mouth of the Sky Eater to break into it safely. So you have to break some geodes on the planet for some reason, doing this opens the planet in half. So then you need to break some more geodes on it and we eventually are able to push the planet into the mouth of the Sky Eater, which clogs up the mouth long enough for us to make our way inside of it. Then you have to shoot down some things guarding the landing bay and once you do, you can make your way down to that landing bay. Which, by the way, I think the animation for this landing is a glitch because this happens. I don't really know. It takes way too long. I think I should pop in real quick and say something. This is the last sky section in the entire game. There are no more sky vehicle portions after this. This is the last one. Kind of a lackluster finish. But I think we should give a proper send-off and talk about some of the best sky sections from the game. I think some of the standout ones is the one in the Cloud Kingdom. That one is really fun and is the best sky section in the first three chapters. The next one I think is great is the one from Gadify Glades, a nice short one that is super creative. I think the one that we get in Captain Clux, Chicken HQ is awesome, a giant rooster chases you and then you have to shoot it down in a rooster boss battle. Great. Monstrous Isles also has another pretty good one and very open. You can have a lot of fun in there because there's a lot of sky in this one. The last great one in my opinion is the one found in the Vault of the Ancients and the best sky section in the entire game. Wow. Is this sky portion beautiful? It is. It's great. It's amazing. Sky had some very amazing tracks. Sad to see you go sky vehicle sections. Thank you for making this game a bit better. Sometimes. This landing dock we were on is just a big enemy gauntlet, and once you complete it, you meet up with Glumshanks for the land vehicle section, although you don't have to do a lot of driving in this one. So what happens is you get launched into a guessing game. You have to choose the correct path between two options, and then you have to make Chaos's floating can hit it so you can leave. If you guess incorrectly, you have to do the process all over again. Then once you get it right, you have to do this again, except you have to choose between three. Once you complete the second one, this section is over. Then we get a C section, which for the first time is an overhead C track where you have to dodge attacks from a Hydra and then defeat it. Yeah, this one is pretty boring. Much like with Sky sections, we went off with a whimper for the C vehicle sections. This was the last C vehicle part in the entire game. So, like we do with Sky Vehicles, let's go back and look at some of the better C sections in the game. C gets off to a good start, as I think a good one is in the very first level in the Rift to Skylands. 
Also, the water is orange, so pretty cool if you ask me. In the Cloud Kingdom, we have an awesome sea track where you get to have a nice boss fight at the end, and it's overall a great sea section. While the sea part in Gadfly Glades is short, I still believe it's a great part. In my opinion, the best sea area in the game, though, is the one you play in Captain Clux, Chicken HQ. First of all, the water is purple, and purple is awesome. Well, not at the beginning part, the water isn't purple there. The beginning for it is a bit slow, but once you get to the part where you start racing in the purple supersized water is where it gets a real lot of fun. Though a contender for the best vehicle section of the entire game is a segment in Vault of the Ancients. The puzzle parts are still fun, but the parts where you can just explore the vaults is even greater. Coming into this, I stated that before I replayed Superchargers, sea vehicle sections were my favorite and I still agree with that sentiment. I think that the sea vehicle tracks have the most fun within them. You can go underwater, which I really like, and you get some sick air time within some of the sea sections that you get in the game. It's really amazing. I think that they're also the most consistently good tracks. Land and Sky have some really abhorrent tracks when it comes to the game in certain points, but when it comes to the sea tracks, I don't think any of them are actually like terrible. Some are better than others, but there isn't a super terrible C segment in my opinion. But now we say goodbye to C vehicle sections forever. Thanks for making this game better, C vehicle sections. You too will be missed. We next get these super weird platformer parts that never show up in any of the other games or even this game besides at this level. And some of them can hurt you. You have to closely look at the platforms to tell which ones are okay and which ones are unsafe to go through. After going through this first section of these platforms, there's a little section where you can collect some gold and then another wave of these platforms. Then we get a small enemy gauntlet that isn't really that hard. Once this is completed, we get on a platform and go to the chaos boss fight. Yep, we're already about to go to the chaos boss fight. And once we defeat Chaos, this game will be over. Hmm. Let's go to that boss fight. So we enter Chaos's domain along with the Dark Rift engine to stop Chaos. Flynn, Callie, and Glumshanks enter as well, and they see the darkness and try to set up the Dark Rift engine. Then Chaos appears to talk about how we are doomed and stuff, and the boss fight begins. So for some reason, Chaos grows all of a sudden. Um, okay. Anyway, this boss fight is underway. Chaos teleports around the floating platforms we are on and shoots sharp crystals at us. This is his first wave. He does this for a little bit, then he grabs a giant sword which moves the cube cubes on the platform up and we have to jump over them. He starts shooting crystals at us again but in bigger quantities. He also has another move where he can clone himself. Most of the boss fights are just the moves I already listed just over and over again. Eventually after trying to hit us with his sword, the sword shatters so he is forced to use another plan. We see some pink hands that I guess he controls and these hands make the platforms move so we have to dodge them. While his hands are resting we can attack them. He tries to smash us with one of his hands and you attack that as well. His final stage is his hands making the biggest cube shards we have seen yet and you need to dodge them all. Then eventually Chaos starts doing it himself and moves to the center of the map and shoots a giant energy blast and while he's resting we can attack him for some more damage and he is finally defeated. Now with Chaos gone we can finally turn on the Dark Rift engine so Flynn tries to turn it on only to be frozen by the darkness. The darkness appears and starts taunting us and talking about how he has won. Then the darkness makes the biggest mistake of his life. He says that Chaos answers to him and that Chaos is his minion. Foolish troll, he answers to me. Isn't that right, Chaos? <laughs> you see that, Glumshanks? Now that's how you handle your minions. He orders Chaos to destroy the Rift Engine, and it looks like he's about to do it, but then Chaos turns on the Dark Rift Engine, defeating him. Chaos then tells the Darkness that only he can tell himself what to do. Chaos, Glumshanks, Flynn, and Cali make their escape as the Darkness gets consumed by the Dark Rift Engine. <laughs> Chaos! What have you done? Nobody tells Chaos what to do except Chaos, and that's me, and I'm him, and you're history! Wowzers! I can't believe the little guy did it! Ah! Uh, maybe we should adios out of here. Come along, Glumshanks! We're leaving! Right behind you, Lord Chaos! I won't go back! The universe is mine! You'll pay for this chaos! No one betrays the darkness! Chaos! We escape in time to see the Sky Eater is being destroyed. We get one final cutscene with the entire gang on Sharpfin's ship, and Flint ends the game like he always does by saying boom. And credits roll. Yeah, that boss fight sucked. 
it was way too easy and over way too quickly. It's almost like it wasn't the final boss fight, but whatever. I guess at the end of the day, that is a supercharger experience. Wait, what is that? <laughs> you didn't really think this was over, did you? You can't defeat me, fools! Skyland is doomed, and the universe is mine! All shall fear and obey me! I am the darkness! Yep, that is right. They faked you out, and this game isn't over, and you must battle the thing that has caused all the evil during this series. It's finally time to take out the darkness once and for all. I can't wait to see what this boss fight is all about. The darkness? This is the biggest boss we've ever had in the entire series. <laughs> oh my god, the biggest boss fight in the entire series is in a vehicle section. You gotta be kidding me. So, it looks like the darkness got some scraps from the Sky Eater and put it on himself. The darkness shoots obstacles at you and you need to dodge them while at the same time going through speed boosts. You have to go through 4 speed boosts and if you miss one you have to do it all over again. Once you get through the 4 speed boosts you hit the darkness with your vehicle and you can attack the darkness then. You do this twice and after the second time you do this the darkness sends you to another dimension where he is most powerful. He also sends his minions called Shadow Guardians at you. In this track, you have to dodge yellow crystals and have to destroy the Shadow Guardians. At the end of the track, you speed boost into the darkness, doing some more damage to him. You do a similar track to the previous one, except this time the yellow crystals move, and pink flying crystals appear, which shoot green beams at you. And they can be very hard to avoid, so good job, I guess, at making this level challenging, Superchargers. Once again, at the end of this track, you speed boost into the darkness, and you go back to the first section you were in. You dodge the purple, sticks again and speed boost into him. Eventually the pink crystals show up again and try to get us to miss the speed circles. Eventually after hitting him long enough the darkness is finally defeated. Yeah this boss fight sucks. The biggest and baddest villain in the entire series and you have to fight him in a vehicle. Why? Just why? I mean, there was already enough boss fights ruined by vehicles, and sadly, that is the case for the darkness. This is the ultimate downfall of superchargers, in my opinion. Too many wasted opportunities for the sake of vehicle sections. Kind of funny that the very thing I hated the most about superchargers was the final moments of the game. Ain't that the truth. So after everything is done, Flynn is chatting up with Callie and Hugo, then all of a sudden Chaos pops up with a suitcase. Chaos declares if anyone's going to conquer Skylands, it's going to be him. However, with the darkness gone, he can't use his powers for evil. So Chaos decides he will reside at the Academy as the ultimate evil consultant of ultimate evil. Buzz decides it's a good idea to keep Chaos around so they'll be able to watch Chaos at all times. Then Flynn's about to say boom, like he always does, but then Mags interrupts him to try to say it. Hugo tries to say boom, and then Callie tries to say boom as well, and they all fail. Then Flynn decides they should all say boom together. Okay, I think I see what's missing. Let's try it all together. On three. One. Two. Three. Boom! boom! Now that was awesome! <laughs> I'm not crying, you're crying. They say boom all together and it's beautiful. We get our usual Eon cutscene at the end, but this time it's interrupted by Chaos. Chaos thanks us for getting rid of the darkness, and then he says that he's the one that saved all the Skylands, and for real this time, roll credits. Well, here we are. You know, usually when you talk about something, almost anything for like an hour, two hours, whatever, there isn't a lot left to be said, uh, but not in this case. Uh, there are still some things I'd like to talk about, but this is the majority end of the video. We finished Superchargers. Amazing, you know, I this video always felt like it was so far away from being complete. 
I obviously haven't uploaded in a while. This is why I wanted to make this so big. I thought this would be a really cool project to put together, you know? And at, when it's finally almost over, it feels weird. You know, it's like when you finish a TV show and like, you really just can't believe it's over. So you try to find anything you can to make that go on, like go to the actors, Instagrams, Twitters, whatever. That's just what this kind of feels like, honestly. Cause you know, I, I edited this video as I went along. So like I made the script, I edited it, but like I was always kind of editing this video as we go. And as of right now, really the only thing I have to put in the video is this here, the thing I'm recording right now, which is wild, honestly. I don't think my opinions of superchargers really changed all that much. I think the, this playthrough I had of it more just like strengthened it, honestly. You know, I, I, I don't hate superchargers. I think, I, like I said, I, I don't hate any of this kind of games. I think they're all good games, to be honest with you. But superchargers always felt like a little bit of a letdown, a disappointment. You could say, see, see what I did there. But um, I still had some enjoying playing it. Some levels I did not have enjoy playing it, obviously. But there, there's a good majority of levels that I, I did like playing through. And I was like, you know, th this is still a good game. It's still, Skyrim Supercharger is still a good game. But I think the gap between last place, which in my rankings is Supercharger and fifth place, with the Swap Force is like this when everything else is like like this, you know, like like that it's not that far i think supercharger is just very much far and away is and saying the word worst i think is a bad way to say because it, it makes it sound makes it sound bad i i think i'd rather say it's the least best game i, I think that that is a better way to put it because like i said superchargers isn't a terrible game it, it far from a way terrible game the worst thing a game can do is be boring and superchargers is not boring so it passes that a, a game that's boring is worse than a game that's actively bad in my opinion because a game that's actively bad you can kind of make fun of it if there's like a bunch of glitches in it that's why it's bad you can kind of you know do stuff with the glitches stuff like that but a game that's boring is just nothing there you know and that's and that's superchargers it's it's not boring so i there isn't really you know too much i want to say there's a lot i can say but there's not too much that i think i i need to say at, at this point in the video but i might as well so i think superchargers ran into the problem of the developers running out of ideas because i mean superchargers and imaginators had to be made around the same time maybe a couple months into superchargers element the people of vicarious visions knew about imaginators so i i think since they knew that you know the next game we're creating skylander they're you're creating your own skylanders and it, it's kind of like well what are we gonna do like how how are we gonna at least make something like that and i i guess maybe the idea of vehicles was something that they maybe had talked about for a while when superchargers came out i'm not sure but just think about it like spires adventure the gimmick is the the um fact that it's toys to life which is completely fine with it doesn't need to be in gimmick in the first game giants it has light cores in it which is really cool figures that glow up and is also the giants swap force obviously in theory has the best gimmick the coolest most creative gimmick where skylanders can swap tops and bottoms trap team you can trap villains and play as them and imagine as you can create your own skylanders and then you have superchargers where you can just ride vehicles you know what i'm saying like and i think the the biggest reason why i probably don't like superchargers is as much as some other people is just down to preference i don't like racing games all that much I, th I think the only racing game i really ever liked is super mario on the wii or super mario kart on the wii whatever it's called and even then i try to replay it and i haven't had as much fun with it as i as i thought i once did maybe that's just because i was a little kid when i was playing it and i didn't really have that good of judgment but when it comes to superchargers i just i don't like you know vehicle games really i i don't find that much enjoyment and that's probably the biggest reason why i i don't like it as much especially because you know some of these levels a good majority of them are vehicles like like i said with um i think it was monstrous isles without vehicle sections in that game that level is really short like perilous pastor short from from spires adventure and that's a that's a short level it's 
It's it a, a lot. That's actually what I found with a lot of these levels is when I went back to it because I haven't played Supercharger since I did my every level rank, which at this point was about a year ago, which is kind of crazy to think about. But uh, I didn't really remember how short some of these levels are without their vehicle sections, and there, some of them are really short, like <laughs> super short. So I think the developers were expecting you to play with the vehicles, like all the vehicles, to boost out that level length. See, see, in my opinion, supercharger's levels without vehicles should be as long as any regular level, and then the level gets a bit longer because of those vehicle sections. Not the level is as long as most levels because of vehicle sections. That that's just my opinion, though. And when it comes to supercharger racing, it's like uh, it got it got the joke. Supercharger racing got the joke. You know, it understood the assignment because when you have a game that you know is just going to be vehicles and that's it your expect your expectations are immensely lowered obviously you know you don't really take too much like you don't really think as badly about it as maybe super it's like superchargers when you go into it you're like thinking oh this is going to be a scanner's game then you find out like 50% of the game is vehicles and driving in vehicles and stuff like that so when when it comes to super superchargers racing i think it's obviously not as good as a game of superchargers like not even close i mean it's it's a 3ds game it can't be as good as a console game but i feel like overall you kind of just understand the game more you know and you come out of it thinking you know that was a good racing game when i stopped playing superchargers like that was a good but not great platformer and racing game like what like platformers and racing don't really match up all that well in my opinion there's really only other uh, not only other one game i can think about and i don't remember the name right now where you do platforming and racing and it's like a crash game where like i think the hub worlds you can platform and stuff like that but i think that's it that's the only other game i've heard of where you platform and racing now there's probably a couple more but i haven't heard of them so i'm not going to mention them right now maybe like like crash warped there's a lot of vehicle sections in that game, and I think the majority of people don't like War because of that. So, just saying. So, since I didn't really have time for putting a level review after playing the Sky Eater, I'm going to tell you that it scored a 70 out of 100. It, it really isn't that good of a level. <laughs> and at the beginning of this video, I also said that at the end of the video, I would, you know, collect all the scores and then give the game an average score. I did that, and the average score for Superchargers is 71.76. Honestly, I feel like that is a pretty, pretty good fitting for this game. This game, when it comes to Skylander series, it feels like a 70 out of 100, man. Because I think I think every other game should score higher than like a 70 out of 100. If I if I do this type of video again and score each level, that might fluctuate as some games have more levels and stuff like that. But just let me know that. The entire game of Superchargers is around a 72 out of 100, 71 out of 100, whatever you want to call it. At the end of the day, this video was more of like a giant review of Superchargers than just an hour or so of why I don't like it. Obviously, well, I think it's not the best Skyners game. When I say I don't like it, I really mean why I think it's the best Skyners game, and that's just the wording I use instead. So think of this as just kind of like a giant review of Superchargers as well as some subjective opinions obviously but a lot of my opinions you know i got about superchargers pop obviously come from facts as we're like a majority of levels have a lot of vehicles in it and stuff like that this not only works as my big video about criticizing superchargers it also works as like a giant review of the game and this is a good transition into something i really want to talk about now because even though this video took months to make i had a lot of fun making this video this is like the most amount of fun i've had in a while honestly for making a video and i just want to know would you guys like to see this style of video but for another game either ssa giant swap force trap team or imaginators i'm i'm really curious because you know I, I i like i i personally like making longer videos like every level ranked and 10 years later were two of my favorite videos ever made in both those clock in over an hour and i'm pretty sure this is going to clock in over an hour eventually so I, I do want to know, like, do you guys want to see this again? You know, would you guys like to? And if you guys do want to see one this style of video again for a Skyrim's game, 
please go down in the comments and tell me um what game you'd like to see this for whether that be spires adventure giant swap for shrapnel magic i already said that um because i i wouldn't be opposed to doing like a little mini series for the rest of this year where i make like hour-long videos about each game i think that would be awesome honestly i think that'd be a whole lot of fun um dissecting the game dissecting the story dissecting the history of the game you know why the game was made you know and if this video does well i'll think about it but I, obviously i want to hear from you guys if you enjoyed this video and if you want to continue um seeing videos like this from me because I, I honestly had a lot of fun making this anyway i want to tell you that i got the original idea to this video from oh, wrong way this video right here it's like a three hour something long video about a tv show called lab rats and i um i watched that video and i was like wouldn't it be cool if someone made this for like skylanders i think that'd be really cool honestly i think that'd be awesome so i forgot who the creator was i'm really sorry but whoever made that video shout out to him and yeah that's where i got a big um inspiration boost for, for this video i was like you know I, it'd be, wouldn't it be cool if there was like an hour-long video about superchargers i i, I think so so I think I, I should just talk about that now on obviously is that uh, that's where I got my inspiration for this video. But at the end of the day, Supercharger is still a good game. If you're a fan of Skylanders, you're going to be a fan of Superchargers. I feel like I'm not the biggest fan of Superchargers, but it has its high points. Mainly, I think what people tend to talk about with the game is a story, which undoubtedly is the best story out of any skylanders game it's not close whatsoever it's really there there's no other story that's touching the story of this game it's it's so far and away the best story it's not even close um that that just that, that's the thing the, the game gets the best because you know we finally get um kind of closure for chaos when it comes to him and evil in the darkness obviously imaginators kind of ruined some of that but Chaos finally gets a bit of closure in this game, you know, and I think that's really interesting. I still have my problems with certain aspects of the story. Like I said, the story isn't too important when it comes to reviewing a game, but I still think it's important nonetheless. I think that, you know, it's something that should be talked about it is how good the story is. But I also think it should be talked about how I think that the vehicle sections are pretty bland and mediocre. And really? <laughs> that's it i'm not gonna try to make a big big fat outro you know i'm not gonna try to do all crazy stuff you know i just want to say thank you for watching this video thank you for being here if you were if you watched this entire thing you know shout out to you this video is in the running for my longest video it might not end up being longer than every level ranked but i do think that it can be close at least or or not who knows maybe i'm not saying well i just this video is only five pages less than every level rank and this video has considerably a lot more um what's like unscripted parts like the intermission like the timeline discussion stuff like that every level rank didn't have that so this video could end up being my longest video ever and if it does it's gonna be very ironic that it's about superchargers anyway guys have a great day and thank you for watching this video peace So, your Fortnite Gamer TV? A new day is dawning. Your moment is near. So tap off your tank and rev up that engine. Cause we're kicking this thing into gear. You got the code. So strong, you got the spirit of a champion, and you're not gonna flee from the fight. That's why we're super charged with love. You got the passion, you got it. Yeah, you got the pride. <laughs> Even in the unknown, you are never alone. You got all. Yes, we
Yeah. 